put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Discount Dishonored with Working Stealth, Thief 2014, Video Game Review. You take on the role of Garrett, the Master Thief. You are on a mission with Eren, who you mentored for a while, out to steal the Primal Stone from the, the Baron's mansion. However, when you get there, you find that he and a group of other men, all hooded, so you can't tell who, are engaged in ritual involving the Primal Stone. And though you try to abandon the mission, Erin insists on still throwing herself into it and something happens. It's not entirely clear to you or to Garrett what happened, but yeah, you, you do find out. And, you know, fast forward a year, the city is dealing with the plague-like gloom. You start having these hallucinations, flashbacks about Aaron. And you have to find out what's going on. I know that sounds like a mouthful and you're just barely following on. Trust me, it's like that playing the game as well. It This just drops you right in the middle of the story. And you are just struggling to keep up. I have now played the entire game. I've read the wiki a uh, thief about some of the major characters and the major plot elements. I'm still a little confused and I may never fully understand the story here. And I... It sh I, I should warn even this early on that there is there is relatively little closure at the end of the day so if you go into this if you intend to go into this, just be aware of that fact. But I will try not to criticize elements of the game, of, of the story that I just don't quite understand because even though I feel like I paid close attention and picked up clues and such, it's possible that it does make sense and there is something in there that I just missed. Now, Obviously, part of what you're trying to deal with in this is, you know, you're seeing all around the city this gloom taking a lot of lives. And I wonder if it has anything to do with the ritual. I'm going to be criticizing elements of Dishonored in this, at least in that the plague is a mystery and it seems yeah it it has this really it it renders it, it leaves you feeling powerless it seems like there is no end to this devastating illness and it really works in that and here it yeah because Hypothetically, if it had to do with the ritual, then maybe, you know, the, it, it will be addressed by you finding out what really happened at the ritual, and maybe you'll be able to do something about it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, that, that part is really way too obvious. Now, faced with this mystery, first thing you want to visit the site of the ritual, you want to try to read up, try to figure out what happened in this year. 
Nope, Garrett does no such thing. He does at least ask the people that he can trust and visit Aaron's hideout fairly early on. He just doesn't find out a lot from either. That's the the thing. The A lot of this really is just hints and one of the first things you do is visit the the queen of beggars who you know garrett says you you know they say you know everything and she's like only the important things or something everything that goes on in the city something like that and in spite of that she insists on speaking in riddles and not that much either it's that's that's a lot of the the plot exposition in this there's there's just a lot of little hints and clues and a little bit of detail and yeah it's just again if you go into this and you really want to get a lot out of the story it's kind of frustrating to try to follow it now things are in general pretty bad in the city Orion called the voice of the people is trying to encourage a you know some some at at the very least civil disobedience you know there's and and his his group the graven appeal to a lot of these beaten down you know poor people suffering from the gloom which doesn't seem to to particularly garner them any sympathy from the people in charge and that you know thus this you know the the franchise continues to explore the theme of class warfare of pitting the few rich against the many poor the baron rules the city with an iron fist we're mostly told about the Baron. He acts in part through the Thief Taker General, a very powerful man. I'm, I'm not, I'm not speaking of magic power, but but like, you know, yeah, there's influence and you know, soldiers at his command and, and such. The the lawmen are abusing the you know the the defenseless, harassing them, you know, falsely arresting them, beating them in public. Insert you know U.S. police joke here. Yes, we do have Garrett not knowing what's going on and he's finding himself in you know a place he doesn't quite know and he's trying to figure out what really happened you've got Jason Bourne in my garret I love both of them but they do not belong to together recently Heroes Reborn aired its pilot I have not yet watched it I will probably. Anyway, I was directed to a Vox.com article about the pilot, and it it points out some problems with the pilot that are problems with this one as well. Do not expect that the audience will care about the plot. You know, give them a reason to care. Do not make the main driving ambition of the protagonist just filling in the blanks of what has happened. Don't explain everything, but do explain some things. Yeah. And you know when when I watched the trailers, I got the idea that the the hammers you know let out a supernatural evil, and you know the we also very clearly see you know the lower class being harmed by 
industrialism, and this is utterly spelled out in the trailer where the first two games hinted. And yeah, the the I've already d drawn something of a comparison. I'll I'll get more into detail on it between this and Dishonored and. Yeah, you know, neither of these come close to reaching the level of Thief 1 and 2. But, you know, when... Dishonored has a lot of the feel of classic Thief. And, yeah, you know, when the original Thief pioneered this kind of stealth, you know, gameplay, yeah, now that a sequel is so late, it has to copy successful games in the the genre. But to be fair, it does some different things with the plot. And the 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 gloom has people dying alone, often in the streets. The lore and the factions are gone from this the you know what was in the first three thief games is just yeah where you know the the original game introduces the three factions you know one might hope that this one shows them in new situations characterizes them accurately and distinguishes them very nicely from each other. That last one was just barely achieved by the third Thief game. And, you know, having this this idea of the, the hammers and the mechanists who are, you know, whose goal is spreading industrialism and yeah, basically, you know, a, a man is only as good as the work he does. And, you know, they are very brutal against those who break the laws. There's a... In the first game, in one of the very first levels, I'm not going to give away exactly which one, you break into a prison and you read what the hammers do to, you know, they're prisoners. If you lied, you have hot coal placed in your mouth. Thievery is, of course, the old classic of, you know, cutting hand off. Yeah, it goes on like that. And, you know, the, the, yeah, the hammers and the mechanists versus the pagans and the Kershock, who are not quite human anymore. They they worship nature and the the chaos and ruthlessness of pure nature where you're just another life form. If if the you know the, the balance of nature is kept up by life forms killing and devouring each other, you're just another life form in that overall balance. Don't think that you, just because you're a human being, have special value to the pagans, to, to nature itself, at its rawest. And, you know, you have in the middle between the two, keeping, or, you know, four. The Mechanist and Kershock are both offshoots of the main factions. And then you have the, the middle faction, the Keepers, who, you know, I was hoping that maybe they would get an offshoot in this one. The The first game introduces the three factions, the three core ones. Thief 2 introduces the, the Mechanists, the offshoot of the Hammers, Hammerites, the Order of the Hammer. And Thief 3 introduces the Kershock, who are sort of an offshoot to the Pagans, although I suppose it's more accurate to say that the Pagans are an offshoot of the Kershock, but yeah. So yeah, it would seem like this 
would be a good time to introduce an offshoot of the keepers and each game you know to, to be fair each game somewhat explores one of the three factions I'm not going to give away exactly which one explores which there there would be some spoilers in doing so but to more to more explicitly explain the keepers they try to know everything that goes on and they basically they understand the the point of view of both factions and they could intervene because they are quite numerous and fairly powerful but they do not they allow these two sides to engage in this merciless ongoing war and they do so because they realize that if either side wins it would be devastating to everyone and for an example of what might happen if one side wins play thief 2 yeah what i'm trying to say is this is the the trilogy the thief trilogy has very compelling lore and factions that are very intriguing to explore and the trilogy does that rather well and then in this one all of that is done away with. Now, others have already pointed out that the plot here is somewhat dull and weak, and the... Yeah, I've already mentioned some about the ending. The ending is not very good, and like everything else about this, it feels rushed. Some have gone as far as to say that there is no logic to the plot. I wouldn't excuse me, quite say that, but certainly, as others have pointed out, it goes pretty much where you overall expect it to. It, it doesn't have that many surprises, although some twists. And it's... It's been called pointless and bland, which, yeah, again, I partially agree with it. The ending, in addition to not providing much closure, just doesn't really... Some of the most important parts of a story is how you open it and how you end it. The opening should grab you and the ending should floor you. At, at the at very start of the story, you should want to delve deeply into this, to know everything about this story, this world, these characters. And at the end, it should really leave you with a feeling of awe that, that this was well worth your time, that your life has been enriched by this. That is, that is what really great stories aspire to. I'm not saying that every story ever has to be great, but certainly this one wants to be great because there are there are there, there is a fairly gr grand scope to it, and big things happen in this, but. Yeah, at the end of this, you don't really feel like it needed to have it you don't feel like you needed to know this story particularly. Overall, I will say I enjoyed the story to to an extent. Again, noting these problems and I yeah, over the course of it, I did feel like I got more of a grasp on what was going on. Just still, there are 
details, important details, that I'm still not sure about. And some have said it's, you know, too fantasy driven, too supernatural driven. It's about as supernatural driven as the first and the third Thief game. I, I don't know if... It's, it's possible that it's more today's... That, that, you know, certainly I don't... I, I don't feel like it needed to be as supernaturally driven as it is, but those who say that it is just too supernaturally driven, compared to the trilogy, it doesn't really... Yeah, it's... It's, it's not new to the franchise, and it's not to some excessive extent or the like. And the yeah, I, I suppose it is. I, I honestly don't know that much about the genre today. I don't play that many stealth games, in part because a number of them there are RPG elements, and I. I'm not good at the whole choosing, making important choices thing. I prefer my games to not be quite so. Certainly, I prefer for RPG titles to have consequence and choice. I think that is just the better way for it to be. But overall, I don't. There, there are several franchises that I do, you know, System Shock and thus also Bioshock and Deus Ex. And possibly others that I, yeah, but overall I don't go for too many RPG elements in, yeah. Now, the, like the Arkham games, or at least in, anytime I compare this to the Arkham games, I am only referring to the first two. I have not played any others, nor do I particularly know much of anything about the others. Our protagonist makes mistakes that you don't really... and, and find himself in situations that he takes great pains to avoid. And this is so that plot can happen. This is so that you can be put in situations that are dramatically interesting, but where, you know, we who know these characters immediately cry foul and say they would never do that. They would never, but yeah, it is to, in order to tell a good story, you sometimes do have to, yeah. Some have say that the plot doesn't really fit Garrett. <laughs> I, again, I'm not sure that it really is any no no more so than particularly again the first and the third. The second one isn't particularly supernatural driven, although it does have elements of the supernatural. The, the supernatural isn't integral to Thief. I, I, that is something that is yeah. If, if you've played the first three, again, trying not to go into spoilers, there, the, the supernatural is right there, very early on, in all three of them. Now, this takes a number of names, you know, yeah, the, the names of people and places, actual people and actual places from the trilogy, but otherwise, yeah, it doesn't really... It is a reboot. It doesn't take too much from there, but... These... I, I believe this is the... I, I'm not sure if it's these specific developers or just another part of the, the the overall company, but this is the company who also put out Deus Ex Human Revolution, which is also 
Well, okay, to be fair, that one is more of a prequel than a reboot, but that one does very distinctly link itself to the first two, and it does what the second one failed to do, which is open itself up to people who've never played the first one. Because if you... The first one has a ton of plot, a ton of detail to the world, and the second one really assumes that you've played the first one and remember everything. Otherwise, you will have a lot of trouble following. In the third one, you won't appreciate all these things, but you're not going to be lost if you haven't played the first one or the second one. And in this, it does kind of just... Yeah, reboot. It, it keeps some of these details, but changes a lot. I will get more into that later on. Now, something that I do think is noteworthy here is that, you know, the, like I said, the you start it kind of in the middle of the plot. Like, when you first take control of Garrett, he is already on the mission that makes up the prologue, the, the mission to steal the primal stone. And there is no, like, in... Yeah, yeah, the, the, the first three, the plot starts a few levels in, or sometimes more than a few, and before that it's just world building. The, the first and the third open with tutorials, you know, teaching you just how to do the, you know, this does start with a tutorial, but it's also the prologue. You have to pay close attention or you'll miss story elements. Where, yeah, the first and the third... I mean, it's not that there's no... It's it's more world building than story in those. It's not that, you know, if, if, if you're paying attention to, to what you're told in those, you'll still get more out of the, the overall experience than otherwise. But you can just, you know, play them without paying too much attention to that and just focus on learning how to do the, you know. There are some games that should not be the first game you play of, you know, for example, first person shooter. This should not be the first first game you play with, like, from, from first person perspective with the WASAD control you know, layout, because you will have trouble following it. You know, yeah, it'll say, you know, okay, and you use that key, and then you... But with all the, the plot that's already going on right from the start, yeah, you're going to be lost. But, with that said, yeah, the plot starts right away, so there is no... You know, there there's no... Again, I'm not... It's not that the, the first three are at all wasting their time. They do just take a little bit to for, for the plot to really start. Which I I love them as they are in, in that well, the first two. I do really appreciate that this one starts the plot immediately. I think that is a good way to, to do it. And again, it's this makes a number of changes. That's a change that I think was good. I'm, I'm not saying that this would necessarily have been a worse game if the plot hadn't started right away, but I do think that it's... Yeah, I, I like that it does start right away, that immediately you are dealing with the, the plot. It's just the fact that it starts... <sighs> What's the word in in media res something like that? Yeah, you you um, Yeah, I, I know big words It's it's a Yeah, the the I wish it didn't quite rush into as much as it does, but yeah now, you may already be able to... I absolutely love the first two games. The, the third one, I consider a good stealth game. 
the biggest problem it has is that it lacks a clear identity. It's not quite Thief, it's not quite Deus Ex, and yes, I would prefer it to be Deus Ex rather than in limbo like it is. And I will try to be honest about all four of them. This is not Thief. But it is a good stealth game with some problems. And I, I honestly had more fun playing this than the third. And without a doubt, the third game is a more complete game and a more polished product. This has a bit of a slow start, but if you give it more time, you may find it to more to your liking. I certainly started liking it more a few missions in. And again, I'm not saying that necessarily other reviewers are wrong, and I certainly understand... Well, I'm not entirely not saying that some of them are wrong, but I'm not saying that if you didn't play on, for, you know, after this start. I understand. Like I said, the, the opening of a story should grab you. It shouldn't leave you kind of meh as this does. And I completely understand the ones who had actual technical problems. Yeah, that the fact that they quit early on, that is that makes complete sense to me. But if that wasn't if if you didn't you know, if if you if you gave it more of a chance, which again, not saying that everyone should, and it's not really the the player's responsibility to give a game too much of a chance. It's more the developer's responsibility to really grab us. If if they want a you know a praised product, but. Yeah, I think some of the reviews that criticize the, the opening and where, where they say, you know, I, I quit early on because it was so boring, I think they might have come to like it if they had played on. Now, along the way you will read newspapers with really clearly propaganda articles, and yeah, they're, they're quite nice. Now, I've already mentioned that the this opens with a tutorial, which acts also as a prologue. It's an okay tutorial. It is fairly short, and it's it's not skippable. But yeah, you know, as tutorials go, it's it's okay. It's yeah, it's not going to be too much of a of a headache to you, basically. My personal experience as far as technical issues, I, I'm i not saying that I'm in no way accusing others of like, you know, just not having a good enough system or, you know, that they themselves had somehow missed, like it, that they hadn't properly checked that wires were connected, you know, not at all. But my personal experience, playing it on a high-end PC, and I'm ma mainly saying this to let you know, you know, I, I went into it knowing that a lot of people had had problems, and these were the ones that I encountered. Playing it on a high-end PC via Steam, and so, so yeah, you know, it may have been like a patched version or that Steam's version works better, I don't know. I, I could definitely... It seems like... I don't remember if it was PlayStation 3 or 4, but one of those two apparently had a lot of problems, which, from reading the PC reviews, didn't seem as common there. I experienced no long load times, no lag, no frame rate issues, I never had any issues with save games 
I encountered no game-breaking bugs. There were dialogue bugs, and certainly the volume would sometimes lower significantly. I'm not sure it ever disappeared. And the the dialogue bugs, you're going to find it really breaking the immersion or you're going to find it hilarious. You might hear line number two in a conversation and then as you, you know, a, a few seconds later you'll hear, you'll hear line one in a conversation. You might hear line one twice in a row. There were times where it kind of skipped a little, like, like, like a record. And then there were times where someone would literally say line one twice in a row, then line two would play twice in a row. Yeah, it's, yeah. Now, the Eidos explained why they did not bring Stephen Russell back for Garrett's voice, that his voice as it is today no longer fits Garrett and that voice actors today are experienced, you know, for, excuse me, for video games and, you know, also effects. Yeah, they're exper they expect them to do motion capture and, yeah, that, that was the explanation they gave and I think it is vital to do motion capture for a character that you mostly see from the first person perspective to where you can usually only see their hands and or feet. I'm joking of course, there is still, well, half joking, there is, you know, it. it he's still like, in, in cutscenes and such, you will see him move and yeah, you know, even when you don't see it, it is still necessary to do motion capture for the the character. He finally decided to cover his face, although when you see like cutscenes, he apparently always has it down, so I don't know, mostly, but yeah, he has this cloth that he pulls up, and that is, you know, I mean, Again, I love the first two. I don't know quite if he was just hoping that no one would get too good of a look at him because he specifically says, I think it's in the first one, I'm a thief, not a murderer. Or at least, it, I'm not sure he says it out loud, but it's like a, you know, several mission objectives, several different levels will have that as a mission objective. You are a thief, not a murderer, so don't kill this or that type of person, or maybe don't kill anyone at all. So it's not like if he's seen, he's gonna kill the person. You know, you can, but you know, from from his own personal perspective, it's not. Yeah, and yet he doesn't. He didn't use to cover his face. And I mean, again, at the very least, in Assassin's Creed, again. I've only played one through three, so those five games. I don't know anything about the franchise after that. They do at least hope to kind of blend in. You know, they have the, you know, which Garrett has always had the the head thing. You know, the sort of hoodie kind of thing, which obviously means he's a criminal. It's gonna get more political. Just be forewarned. If you've watched other of my videos especially more recent ones, you've probably gotten used to that. Yeah, he, he's always worn the hood, which they also do in Assassin's Creed, but in Assassin's Creed, they can kind of get away, you know, they don't wear something, you know, Garrett wears this all black leather. I think, I think it's always been leather. I'm not 100%, actually, never mind, I'm not sure it always was, but and he certainly used to wear a cape. Any, anyway, yeah, he's dressed in all black, trying to you know be able to blend in with the shadows. So the fact that he doesn't cover his face 
yeah, in Assassin's Creed, they, they expect to basically be able to fit in because what they're wearing doesn't attract that much attention. Sometimes it seems like it should when they've got really tricked out or stuff. Anyway, yeah, they, they could basically, in addition to it kind of giving, you know, giving the other side a harder time of getting a good look at their face, they do also actually blend in, you know, they couldn't get away with wearing a face mask. Now, yeah, it's already been said that, you know, this, Garrett, that this new voice, I, I don't hold anything against this voice actor, I don't really know him from anything else. Garrett is a difficult character to do right. So, but, but yeah, he does end up coming off kind of flat. And the yeah, it's I've I've recently reviewed Hitman Agent Forty Seven and the Transporter Refueled, and those are two characters that also take a lot to, because they don't express all that much. But there is something going on in there, and you don't want them to just seem wooden. It's difficult to just it's it's. You know, Vulcans are another good example. You have to do it right, because there is something, you know, they're not just like half asleep. It's not that they don't care at all. You know, there is still something there, even if it's maybe buried. Some, you know, with, with Vulcans, it's the, the drive for logic, the, the kind of somewhat distance, but yeah. With all of these characters, it is difficult to do right, and... Stephen Russell did amazing, and yeah, it's it's not really. I I don't think that it necessarily means that this actor is not good. It just might mean that he's maybe not good for this or something. But yeah, in the trailer, he also comments on politics as if he might get involved, which is completely unlike Garrett. And, you know, the whole thing with Aaron, there's clearly some emotional attachment there, which, again, is entirely unlike Garrett. It, literally, the, the opening mission of the second Thief game, he says, I don't usually take personal jobs. So it's, it's yeah, he keeps it completely separate. And if there is particularly any, you know... If there is much of any attachment other than just him taking pride in his work, he keeps that, you know, we, we don't particularly see it. And, you know, he says, you know, the city's changed, I've changed. And, yeah, with this being a reboot, you know, the, the there was a while where I wasn't entirely sure if there was like a, a sequel, you know, there's... There really still something with one of his eyes, so yeah, but yeah, it, it helps to make Garrett and the city new for the audience as well, which is again something important to do. When when a sequel comes ten years after, you really have to make some choices like that. You can't expect everyone to remember or even have experienced the earlier in, incarnations and you maybe also need to update it for a new so yeah and yeah it's it's a decent way of doing that others have already pointed out in this he's kind of part batman part the crow with you know, he beats the crap out of his enemies, and he emos at the top of his clock tower hideout, alone, and... A crow will, will fly in, and... Yeah. They didn't give him a guitar, at the very least. I, I should say, I love Batman, I love The Crow. 
again, they just, they don't belong. Yeah, the, the three don't belong. Or certainly, Batman and the Crow do not belong anywhere near Garrett. Now, the videos, the, the cutscenes are no longer done via silhouette and with a nice low level of detail. There are also more cutscenes than in the, the trilogy. They, you know, some of them are in engine, some of them are pre rendered. And the. They're not all from a first person perspective. There is a lot of atmosphere to them and to this in general. Garrett talks too much and he he has the appearance of a malnourished vampire. Some find him to be arrogant, obnoxious, and really one-dimensional. It's kind of... I mean, this, this gets Garrett's core character fairly decently, and that, again, not everybody is gonna like Garrett. Not everybody does like Garrett. And that's something that, you know, that was part of the subversion in the, the first, you know, the first game especially, because it, you know, the, the second and third followed in that. But when the first came out, you know, that was part of the subversion. This is not a hero. This is barely an anti-hero. He's almost a bad guy. Like, you're play you are playing a thief. There's no, and he doesn't, he doesn't have a problem with that. He is a thief, and he takes a lot of pride in being a master thief. And he is, yeah, there's, you know, this, this was a time when you would usually play as this, you know, big hero kind of, you know, it's similar to how you're actually playing a, you know, a hacker who helped unleash a, you know, a psychotic AI. Although, to be fair, at the time you didn't know how bad it was. In, you know, upon the, the space station that you find yourself on in the first System Shock. So, yeah, they, they liked to put you in the shoes of someone who wasn't your, yeah, wasn't a hero wasn't a traditional kind of, yeah. Now, the... Some of the voice acting is really bad. Some of it's so bad that it really breaks the immersion. And the... I've already mentioned how lines will play... Yeah, in, in the wrong order and repetitively. Every time you go to the same area of the city hub, you will probably hear the same exact conversation again. You might hear it more than once just running around in the same area of the city hub. Now, the, the female yeah, Aaron is this utterly obnoxious, snarky, teen, angsty. <sighs> yeah, she's, you know, emo, goth. I know that emo and goth are supposed to be like two different things. Emos, goths, here's the deal. You do not inflict yourself upon my beloved franchises, the ones that you don't belong in, and I won't talk crap about you. Yeah, she is utterly intolerable, and the plot revolves around her. And it's pretty... yeah the you know it's it's almost impossible to have sympathy for her and then yeah 
the the characters are bland and some have said Orion is the worst character I'm not entirely sure if they mean like worst written or like that he's just really hateable or so I yeah I don't yeah he's he's a bad character a, a poorly done character and some of some of them are also just really underutilized and some pointed specifically to Madame Zhao Zhao and yeah and the one of my favorite terrible lines in this is that there's an exchange between someone you know publicly challenging a guard and the guard and she says and I might get the bird wrong but I don't care enough she says the you know the a new dawn is coming the crow has spoken and the guard asks and he doesn't even like there's not a ton of like sarcasm to his voice he just says and what does it say he's you know he is probably like mocking her but her response is what does it say with marked exasperation as if to say can you believe this guy he doesn't understand crow speak and it's just I mean, she does go on to say what the crow apparently says, but she's not making a really good case for how this is supposed to speak to everyone and how this is a really devastating argument against the City Watch. And it's not difficult to make it a devastating case against the City Watch because, like I mentioned earlier, they are abusive against the people that they are supposed to protect. You know, there's, it's it's not like... This is not like an invading force. They, you know, the city has not been occupied by, you know, a force. You know, there you expect that the, the, you know, you know, soldiers or appointed policemen or such are the the, you know, are awful to the the people who have always been living there. Yeah. And the, yeah, this features modern swearing in a bunch of the dialogue. I am not a prude. You know, the, the, I love Quentin Tarantino's dialogue and how he creatively uses swear words, you know. The problem is that it breaks the immersion. It doesn't fit. And, you know, it's like I, I recently reviewed Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And in that, you know, some have, you know, I believe it was on the IMDb Goose page that it was like incorrectly regarded as Goose. That, you know, well, why is, you know, yeah, the, the accents. Why are not all of them British and such? And, you know, yeah, and it's this, damn, well, you know, technically they should speak in Old English, which is nothing, you know, which is not that like, you know, modern English. So presumably it has been translated. You know, if one were to apply that same argument here, it still doesn't work because these are such... Yeah, it just, it pulls us right out of it. It does use the, you know, the the familiar derogatory terms of Taffer and Jack Noll, and it adds Bleater, which is like, you know, Complainer or something like that, and Sloop, which appears to be like food that hasn't really been made from animals because the animals are dying because industrialism you know heavy industrialism and so yeah they're not eating real meat in their food and 
Yeah, you know, even like it appears that sloop is the actual term for the food. It's not just like, you know, yeah, it's it doesn't just mean bad food, but that is the the actual dictionary definition of you know. But they'll also, you know, yeah, it's it's clearly a negatively charged term. Now, in this one, you can look through keyholes, which was not in the... It definitely wasn't in the first two. Come thing, it might have been in the third, but... Yeah, you know, that was not really a common trait in stealth back then, but today, yeah, you know, you you have a fair expectation of being able to look into the room you're about to go into. So it's nice, you know, a nice addition. And the, you know, like the, the picking locks in the first two, you know, they sought to make it as streamlined and as accessible as possible. Because again, this was a time where a major stealth game was not necessarily going to be, you know, just something, you know, people would necessarily go and, and get. You know, the first commandos also, you know, had to deal with that and it dealt with that by being, it, you know, an amazing game, which the first two Thief games are as well. But in with the first two, they tried to make it very straightforward so you have two lock picks and you you basically just hold down use on you know with one of the lock picks on a lock and it'll either you know you it'll either immediately just click and you know let you know this is not the right lock pick for this the door then you can try using the other lock pick and if this is a door that cannot be, you know, a, a lock that cannot be picked and you just need the key, then it, that will also click. But when a lock pick works, it will, you know, you'll hear this kind of rattling of, you know, movement inside the lock. And you just keep holding down use until it's either completely done or if it clicks again after some rattling, it means you need to use the other lock pick. And yeah, this means that it's just a matter of making sure no one is around to see you pick the lock. And, you know, sometimes the lock would be in the light. So, yeah. And yeah, that, that worked immensely well for the first two. But then, yeah, you know, you maybe want something more complex once you know, stealth is a more viable, yeah, and in the third one, they then added a, you know, they, they made it work through the, the sweet spot, you have to find the sweet spot, and you get a visual representation of the lock as you try to find the sweet spot, and then you, you can see when it's working as well as hear it. The problem in the third is, once you find the sweet spot, then you just have to hold the mouse there for a while. And it just, it gets so tedious fairly quickly, too. And in this, when you find the sweet spot, you just have to press use, and then you can move on to the next sweet spot. And, you know, there will be three to five sweet spots to a single lock. And... Yeah, the the it's it's much quicker and much less Yeah, it's it never gets tedious, although there are a lot of locks to pick and that there are definitely too many locks to pick. It never really gets tedious. It was never, you know, 
it never gets as bad as the first Bioshock. I don't remember about the second one. I tried to replay it recently, but was unable to because DRM. And yeah, so it, it thankfully never does get tedious in this. But the and and something I quite like is in this if you miss the sweet spot if you press you know if you don't quite get the sweet spot and then you press use it will produce a noise you you know and that noise might attract attention so make sure there's one area where well there might be more than one but there's a one specific area that I in which you there's a guard asleep on a couch three foot three feet away from where you are one foot several feet if you mess up even once picking that lock he will wake up and he will spot you immediately so yeah and like in the third and unlike the first two, if you leave a lock before you fully picked it, you have to start over next time. So yeah, you'll definitely want to make sure that you have enough time so that you're not spotted by patrol and that you're still careful so that you don't make noise and attract attention. And the... And honestly, the there's nothing in this that by itself takes too long. You you don't spend too long on any one thing. Nothing in this ever got tedious to me, which again was not true of the first Bioshock. And which I gave a fairly critical review. I stand by most of what I said, but I do now appreciate that it's a better game than I made it sound like. And I still found it. And and I could I had more of a chance to fully appreciate like hints dropped along the way and, and things like that. It was still yeah, it, it got tedious. There's at least one too many stops along the way. In, in that game anyway and when you you know there, there are a lot of doors and windows that you need to pick the locks of and yeah it's there are too many which again doesn't mean it gets tedious ever didn't to me anyway and yeah once you've when when you're opening a window you may have to press the use key repeatedly to like pull it open and again there are just too many windows that this is true of and yeah it that is something that gets annoying now when making this you know this reboot, it was of course necessary to find a balance between whether to satisfy the the substantial fan base of the trilogy or try to make it more modern. And yeah, because a lot has happened since Thief, you know, started it, which I maintain that no game has topped the first two, and I'm I'm not saying that just because they're like they they were the first ones. I can point to tons of shooters that overall top the first two Doom games, for example. I haven't played the third one, probably won't. You know, it's it's not some kind of you know, and I grew up on that as well, although I wasn't a fan back then either. You know, but yeah, the the there have been a lot of changes and it feels outdated if you just try to you know make another you know 
yeah, if you try to make it too much like that. And this one kind of ends up in in the middle of you know of the two of them. The at the same time it has some of the limitations that you know yeah were true of the first two and to an extent also the third one. Yeah, also the third one. And yeah, again, the, the first two are specifically because of streamlining to make sure that it would, you know, that, that people would die it. And yeah, also just, you know, there were a lot of things that you could not do from a technology standpoint back then. And, you know, at the same time, it also, it's very mainstream and has streamlining that, you know, streamlining like in Assassin's Creed, which, you know, yeah, significantly streamlines this whole stealth experience. And, yeah, again... Thief, especially the first two, not really mainstream, not really trying to be, they're, they're accessible. Anyone can sit down and play Thief, but like I said, you know, not everyone's going to like Garrett, not everyone's going to like the world. I, I already described the three factions, you know, extrapolate from that. The, the world is defined to a large part by those three factions and their interactions the you know how much power each of them has what they are trying to do what they have done and yeah that world is not going to appeal to everyone it's yeah plain and simple and it wasn't really meant to and in this one they do try to make it more appealing and you know for example the the goth emo stuff is probably to try to appeal to teenagers and you know it I can see where they're coming from because it has the you know it's always been dark they've always been very gloomy and yeah you know so today yeah, if, you know, people who might buy something that's really dark and gloomy and such might also like this whole emo goth kind of thing. And the... Um, while I never experienced any long low times, definitely there are too many, you know, places where it suddenly has to load the next area and such. Some have said that it's only fun for the first hour, that the the gameplay doesn't change enough. I would... I can see where they're coming from, and that's again... There's... There is some limit to the gameplay there was in the, the trilogy as well. And that's... Again, either you really get into it and you really love it, and... Yeah, you, you keep having fun with the, that gameplay, or you do find it too limiting, and I can see that's an an example of you know again, let's yeah let's say Assassin's Creed. Do you want to climb a building? Do you want to you know run around on the street? Do you want to slowly walk on the street and blend in? You know, do you want to kill every guard you come across and then hide? Do you want to fight all the time, you can do all of those things, you know, and, and the same for, yeah, you know, there, there are stealth games where you're allowed far more situations, but Thief really isn't that, because, again, that's what Garrett is, he is the master thief, and that is what he, yeah, that is what he does, and, yeah, if you don't really get into that, you're not going to find the the games all that interesting and the 
this introduces a sprinting function, which is very welcome because before you couldn't necessarily outrun the negative attention you attract when you're noticed. And it is, of course, limited by stamina, which does not have a visible bar. And yeah, it just it allows you to move very fast in just these short bursts. So, you know, be careful not to run into another group of soldiers and be sure that, you know, that you're running straight, that you're not like running around in like just checking out different rooms because you're not going to, you know, they're going to keep coming after you. And if you just, you know, you got to be running away from them and to a place that you can hide or to a place they can't get to or the like. You don't want to just, you know, you, you can't continue to outrun them. So, and, and I will get into what happens if you do not outrun them. In the last third of this, there are finally some really great set pieces. And, yeah, it's... Like... Yeah, like, like a lot of other ideas in this. They had some really great ideas, but they just don't they're not used that often and honestly it feels like and I, I don't think this is actually the case but it feels like you're watching you're, you're getting about a third of the full experience it, it feels like it was substantially cut down you know the the plot almost moves too fast and you're almost told too little to get everything the yeah, the the various cool, thing, you know, like yeah, like these set pieces. Again, I mean, in in a lot of new games, there are set pieces all throughout. These, you know, I draw a lot of comparisons to Splinter Cell Blacklist. You know, it's it's one of the most recent like major games that are played that has these big, you know, events throughout. You know. Literally, one of the first things that happen in the, the game, in a cutscene, is a big explosion, you know. And, yeah, throughout, you know, big things either are happening or could happen if you're not extremely fast and, you know, stop these things from happening. So it's... And in this, just a lot of it... Yeah, I mean, again, I didn't... I was... I was reasonably interested, but there weren't really that big things going on. Which, again, is confusing because big things are affected by it overall. You just don't see it that much. And this has some third-person perspective. Prince of Persia-like climbing and like Assassin's Creed, there are times where you can't see what movement you're going to make from pressing a button, which again, very unlike you know Prince of Persia, especially the Sands of Time trilogy. And I've, to be fair, it never messed up my stealth that I couldn't see where I was, you know, what move I was going to be making. And, you know, every move I make, every step I take, someone is going to be watching you. Never messed up my stealth, never slowed me down when I needed to run, you know, while being chased. So, yeah, that is greatly appreciated, which is definitely not the case with Assassin's Creed. I don't understand why these weren't done in first-person perspective. You know, do it like Mirror's Edge. It, it doesn't particularly have you doing anything that, you know, that you don't do in Mirror's Edge where it's all first-person perspective. There, you know, so it's not like this was just, well, you can quite do that. It's all in, you know, you're climbing pipes and, you know, crawling, you know, you're, you're hanging onto a ledge and, you know, going over, you know, going to, you know, either side and such. 
there's even some repelling in this. It's almost never useful, and again, there's almost none of it. This is better than Mirror's Edge, you know, parkour. The, the parkour here is better than that. You know, you can always see what you're going to interact with. In fact, in this, you're prompted. You can always see where, you know, where to go. It doesn't start and stop awkwardly. Mostly in this, it's just either you are running or you are just moving. You can see how close you are to the edge before you make a jump. If you miss a, a step in the parkour, you'll lose a second or two. You won't, like, die almost every time. And you can, in, in this, the, the parkour can be used slowly, in which case it won't make noise and you won't really attract, you know, you know how if something moves fast in the dark, even if it's in the dark, you can kind of get a sense something's moving there, even if you can't hear it. In this, yeah, you will be noticed if you move fast, even in the dark, even if you're not making too much noise. If someone is relatively close and looking in your direction, you know. And, yeah, if you, if you move slowly and, you know, stick to the shadows so you're not seeing such, you can use it to get you know, from one hiding hiding spot to another, which, again, is classic thief. You're not just, you know... In... Yeah, you, you're, you're not, you know, just constantly, like, you know, hugging while waiting for a guy to, to go past. Okay, then you can move to the next. You know, in Thief, you can often just get onto a box and then wait for the guy to, you know, maybe climb further up or just wait for the guy to pass you, then go back down and, yeah, you know, so, yeah, you, you get to do that in this as well. You can also use it to move very fast, in which case it will make noise, you will definitely be seen, and, yeah, it, you know, this can be used to escape and you can you know, you can use this once you've already been seen, or if you know that, if, if you don't mind being seen, you're, you're already going to be moving fast in a second or two, so you just start running, you know, whatever. So, yeah, you're, you're not stuck using it purely for one or the other of those two. And the... I was quite pleasantly surprised to see that this maintains at the end of the day Garrett is just a human being you know he's agile he's fast relatively strong he is what you would want in this kind of cat burglar or thief kind of thing yeah he he can't wall run for example he can't make these inhumanly large leaps and such the parkour is a lot of fun, and the, you know, it is quite linear, and again, you're, you're prompted. It's not quite quick time events, but you don't have a lot of freedom in the parkour, which is, again, you know, in Assassin's Creed, you have a ton of freedom in the parkour. You can swoop, which is a fast movement that you can use in any of the, you know, any direction, you know, not up or down, but yeah, and the, you know, you won't be seen doing it, you're not like, you're, you're not as easily noticed, and you know, still, you know, if you do right in front of someone, even if you're in the dark, they might notice, but it doesn't, it's not as obvious, you know, and definitely not as noisy as sprinting is. And, yeah, you can, you can stop it part of the way, you know, if, you, if you're swooping forward, for example, just press backward and he'll instantly stop, you know, and, yeah, the, the noise it does make is minimal, but if you're going over a noisy surface, it will make some noise, and you can do it while crouched. It will use stamina, so if you do it, like, over and over, yeah, 
and it's also just you know you're gonna do some vent crawling in this when you crawl through vents sometimes it can be kind of annoying because you're just excuse me you're sometimes just waiting to get to the end of this so you can move more freely again and yeah you can swoop through that now and the you know and if you ultimately just feel like it makes things too easy you're not forced to use it and that's true of a lot of the helping you know yeah a lot of the the things in here that help make it more accessible help make it you know again they they couldn't necessarily expect that the the following of the first three would necessarily return so yeah they they had to make sure you know i'm not saying that it they don't get a complete pass it's too mainstream too streamlined but you can see where they're coming from to an extent and yeah you you tend not to be forced to use the things in this that you really feel make it too easy i you know some of them you can even like turn off in the you know optional difficulty you know i'll get into those later you do you know basically choose the the path you take but it's linear with set routes you know it's not all that free you when choosing path you can distract guards away from the main entrance and then use that or you can find a side entrance a you know a more hidden entrance that they maybe aren't thinking too much about guarding or maybe it's guarded in another way that's easier for you to deal with and you know it is not like in Dishonored where it's linear with options there are too few options the levels are too small and too closed off for that and there are a lot of scripted events in this you will still overhear convenient conversations that end with the characters walking off so that you know you heard not only did you hear really useful information the the characters have now walked off so you can sneak through that area without having to worry about you know because they'll often be like looking at each other for that the the world is you know just dead there is no kind of yeah you're just you're looking at things you can interact with much of anything you finally have a silent dismount from ladders ropes vaulting stepping down from like if you're on top of a small box and there's literally like there's there's just the tiniest little bit step down you would expect that Garrett would just you know just place his foot down there and then place the other foot down there not hop down and in the first three he always hops down and this is you know comparatively when you're just walking across a you know horizontal surface you do take these tiny steps you you can you know if you if you're sneaking a lot of the time that is what you're doing so yeah in that situation you suddenly can't and now you can you make almost no noise in those situations and finally vaulting can't fail you know again you get the prompt and yeah and when you know when you get the prompt and then you press he's for sure gonna vault you don't accidentally jump and then you know miss I love the way they do vaulting in you know the 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 thief games and system shock 2 i don't 
perfectly recall about System Shock 1. I want to say that one has a 2, but I, I'm not certain. But it doesn't always work, you know, and yeah, here it does. I never missed a jump or a vault or the like. And you can be certain that you will be grabbing the rope. Again, you get a prompt. And yeah, again, that was sometimes a problem. And that again really sucks because suddenly you're making noise or suddenly you're falling and that might actually kill you if it's a steep enough drop. And you can be absolutely certain that a takedown will work including from above. Again, you, you literally can't press the button if it doesn't work. You you know, the button just won't do anything if you know if you can't do the takedown from above. And you know, it is a little unfortunate that the jump key is on the same you know, if you press the jump key twice, you swoop. So you want to be careful that you don't like double press it when you're trying to, but that's not, it's not a really big issue. It's not something that, you know, it's just something to be aware of. And you, you now do not, never waste water arrows. You never try to shoot, you know, a fire, a, yeah, a, an open flame of some sort and accidentally not manage to. This was also true of the third one. And in this, it's true of all the arrows. If you, will hit the target and if you will affect it the way you intend to there actually will be an indicator you you know if and and this again I'm you can turn this off in the you know if you you can turn the the you know the when when you get out the bow you get like a reticle you can turn that off entirely so you know don't don't say that the game is making it too easy in in that you're just not challenging yourself enough with that it's it's but but yeah you know if you're pointing to an open flame with your water arrow out it will literally there will be this little white indicator for that same for a few other things I'm, I'm, I'll get more into what the different arrows accomplish and if you're aiming an arrow at a person there will be this little red indicator if you will hit him or not which again sometimes you would miss just barely and it would be really annoying and it's also just easier to read the reticle now which to be fair it might have been intentional that it wasn't that easy to read, but it's again one of those things where I love almost everything they do in the first two games that make things difficult, but a few of them just go a teeny bit too far. And that, you know, the the games that they made, you know, Looking Glass Studios, were prohibitively challenging you know a lot of people are gonna try and they're just not gonna be able to quite you know complete it and you know I'm, I'm not trying to say that I'm like some you know amazing gamer at, at that it's just I am too stubborn and too patient and I just love the games that they put out you know especially the first person perspective I haven't particularly played the ones not, and again, not the ones that are full RPG. I know that they did some Ultima. Yeah, I, I don't think I would be able to. Yeah, I've tried to play full on RPG games, and I often just can't quite. Yeah, it's just, it's too involved for me. Now when sometimes when you put out a light source if you know yeah if it's an open flame of if if it's a few candles or the like if it's a torch if you do so and an enemy notices he may just go over there and light it back up so yeah take note of that there is no jump key, and I understand that bothers some people. You can do everything that you used to be, well, almost. You know, again, this isn't as open, but a jump key would not have done anything to change that. 
it's it's not less open because there is no jump key because everything that it lets you do anyway the you know the key will respond to and you'll be prompted yeah i i don't have a big problem with that it's yeah it it just isn't a it it doesn't overall change you know the the thing that does bother me is that it's no longer as open as it used to be the the jump key isn't you know that's just something that you know makes sense to do in that case and yeah if you're jumping and not really accomplishing anything by that it's just going to make noise and that's not that's specifically what you're trying not to do and it's also it wouldn't like speed up running away for example you know I'll, I'll take the sprint key and you can have the jump button and I I am I consider myself the the winner of of that barter now one thing there is though is that movement sometimes you have to press the the key to you know yeah to to make it for example sometimes when when you're moving from one place to another you might have to open a window and if you I already mentioned sometimes you then have to tap the use key repeatedly to to open it other times you know and, and these are distinct you you know why it's this way some of the time this other way the rest of the time but other times you don't have to do it and the game will just still open the window just the exact same way and yeah this happens various times so, sometimes when you try to vault sometimes he'll jump over sometimes he'll just vault and this this can actually genuinely mean that you accidentally go too far and you you know you die from and and you the player might have known well i have to vault onto the if if i if i vault and then jump over i'm going to die so i just want to vault but the game decides that it wants to jump over instead and yeah and this does end up making the movement feel kind of artificial and some of the worst is that sometimes when you're above if you're trying to if you're going near an edge and you want to jump off that edge or you know yeah let yourself drop from that you know you can't make a jump you you'll have to just drop from there so the the jump key is not going to do anything unless you're jumping over something else if you're trying to drop yourself down sometimes you go all the way to the edge and if you try to let yourself fall off if you try to keep moving in that direction Garrett will stand on the very edge of it and look over and other times he'll just fall you know if he looks over it means you have to press X again you will be prompted but sometimes you're gonna think and this this is bad both in case you're trying to very quickly get over there and then down because suddenly you know you think that you're gonna hop off and you know that you're gonna drop down from there but then suddenly he stops and you have to press the button and it kinda of breaks your momentum from trying to run away and such which to be fair you know like I said that the parkour doesn't that isn't really part of the parkour anyway the and other times you'll maybe want to get a, a look maybe you know you want to get to the edge and try to look over and he'll just drop down automatically and also note that just because it says drop down it doesn't mean that it's safe to do so and sometimes mostly it's fine but there are a few times where it's a little difficult to tell if it would be safe for you to drop down from where you are to yeah the the game goes for realism some have said that the game is well made but boring and like i said you know it definitely takes patience and it's yeah it is very much kind of the same thing 
throughout the game you know not not that much changes really and if you don't find it that compelling I would say give it at least the first mission maybe the first two missions if you're not sold on the game by the end of the second mission if you find the gameplay boring then the game is probably not for you I, th I think it would be nice if there was like a demo that did just that you know but if there is, I don't know about it, at least. I, w I would like for that to be the case, if it isn't. And, yeah, if, if not, you are going to find it boring. And, again, I don't find it boring, but for sure, a game having boring gameplay is one of the worst sins you can commit when developing a game. That is one of the most important things. The game has to be fun while you are playing it, at least some of the time. You know, it can be extremely challenging and it can be long or, you know, it can be, you know, the kind of thing where it, it can be like trial and error, but if it's not fun to play, like, Mirror's Edge is trial and error. I still have some fun. I The first time is really frustrating. It's more fun to replay that game than it is on that first playthrough. But, yeah, you know, I've played it... Let's see. I've replayed it thrice by now. D two of those times using guns whenever I could. And, you know, the first time I played it and... The remaining time I replayed it, I didn't use guns at all unless absolutely forced to, and yeah, which the game also never does. But yeah, I do have fun playing it. You know, even you know the story and the characters and the the parkour. And the, but I have I enjoy myself when I'm playing it, and that really is you know one of the key aspects of any game. So, yeah, if I thought this was boring, I would slaughter it. Now, yeah, in, I would rather say, you know, to, to me, again, it takes patience. And I'm not saying that it's like, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing to be patient. You, you can wait too long. And I'm not saying, you know, today a lot of people have trouble with, you know, like patience or what do you say, it, it, you know, memory, people of bad memory, you know, attention span, that's the word, two words, it's two words, Larry, yes, the, the, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, a game should have you sold on it all the time, basically, you know, it's, it's not for everyone. Game gameplay that takes a lot of time for you to, you know, get through. That's not for everyone, and that's not at all a, you know, a negative. I, I, you know, when people say that a game that has like where where you actually do have to make some choices and those choices matter, when people say that that is you know like oh too hard that is bs you you should be able you know especially in in with with rpg elements you should have to make choices and those choices should have to should actually matter you you shouldn't be able to just all the time do whatever you want then it's then it's a simulator or a casual not a you know when when i say video game i don't mean simulator i don't mean casual i have no problem with those two genres but i yeah, if, if I ever refer to those, I'm going to be specifically referring to those. But, yeah, other games should be challenging, and they should have you making choices. You know, that's, that's one of the things I loathe about the Assassin's Creed games. Again, the five that I've played, there are no consequences. You can, you know, you, know, you can... You can get a collectible and then run into a crowd of soldiers, kill a bunch of them, then get killed. You respawn, you didn't lose the collectible, and the soldiers are probably gone. Nothing happened. You lost 
nothing. You lost a few seconds of time. And yeah, anyway, I would, you know, for if if you really want to to take it slow and, and such, I would rather describe it as flawed but addicting gameplay. The I would this is when I get into Dishonored. It has too few stealth options, especially for non-lethal. You have to get behind each individual soldier, you know, and, you know, knock them out from behind. It's line of sight in a first-person perspective, which is just absurd. The, the, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in darkness or in light. You're just, you're just as easy to, to, to notice in, in either instance. The, if, if they just, you know, if, if the, the angle just slightly changes between where the guard can see and where you are, which can happen from him just moving slightly, then that's it, you know, fight or load. And you cannot see when they're going to move, which, you know, is when this angle is going to change and when it's going to screw up your stealth. And while you also in this cannot see when they're going to move, in this you can always tell how they're going to move because they stick to patrol routes or go in the direction of the, the distracting, you know, or if you throw a distracting, if, if you try to distract them with something that's too close to them, then they will start looking for whoever did that. And though you can in Dishonored see, see through walls, you know, you shouldn't be forced to use, much less unlock, this ability. You may want to use your runes on other things, and even if you do, it's just not as intuitive as hiding via sound and, you know, sound and light being the, you know, sound and silence, light and shadow, which, you know, the original thief pioneered. Yes, other than that, Dishonored is a great game, but broken stealth in a stealth game is a pretty big problem. And yeah, you can also play it as a first-person shooter, but like I say in my Dishonored review, then you're probably going to want to play Bioshock instead. And if, you know, then you may want to play, like, Fear instead of Bioshock, but whatever. You know, in this, you can usually see what the enemy can. You know, if, if something is in, you know, very much in the dark, the enemy won't be able to see it. And if something is in the light, you can see it and the enemy can see it. So you you know in what situation they will be able to see you as, as far as, you know, again, without them being directly in front of you and, you know, moving, in, if, if you're moving. When the, you know, if they are noticing you, you know, it can take like a second or two where, you know, they, you, you, you'll, you'll have a visual indicator that they're noticing you and there is a noise that's very distinct. You know, it's not like loud and really obnoxious, but you can tell. You can tell when you are being seen in this, which again in Dishonored, it's just they spot you and immediately they just, yeah, they, they react too fast for you to do anything about it. And in this, yeah, you know, you can, you can actually deal with that situation. Although, of course, you'll still want to try not to be seen. And, you know, yeah, if you're not in the light, unless the enemy is very close and, you know, 
it also helps to be crouched. Yeah, the enemy can't see you, and if you're in the light, they will have no trouble spotting you, even from a distance. And yeah, the you know, this is it's it's still not as It's, it's not as nicely done in, in that as, you know, Splinter Cell Blacklist and Thief 1 and 2. You know, neither this nor Dishonored come close to the level of those. And, you know, to be fair to Dishonored, it greatly exceeds this in how polished it is, in the fact that you can fight any time you know, pretty much. I, I didn't. I tried. I, I, I played it very, very stealthy. And the, you know, the fact that you can kill every enemy in you, you encounter, I believe, if you are skilled enough, which is, I believe, also the case in Thief 1 and 2. You just, you really have to be skilled and really count your, your ammo and, yeah the you know how well realized the world is you know i've already mentioned the the plague how overpowering it feels and how ever present it is you know everywhere there are plague rats there are bodies that you know people who died from it and you know the you know how how varied the the magic that you can use is which is also, you know, there's not that much magic use in the player's hands in Thief 1 and 3 either. And, you know, yeah, it does not beat this or, yeah, in having working stealth, you know, it, yeah, it doesn't have working stealth, it doesn't, you know, yeah. But it and and it's yeah it ends up tedious in you know when yeah the you know you you kill someone and you move the next place and you you know you take out someone yeah and the you can now. Uh, you, you can't interact with very much in the environment and the 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 throwable which is still you know for distracting you can still only carry one but you can now store it rather than you know in in the first three, you pick it up and it's the one thing you have in your hands. You know, you can't do anything else before you put it down or thrown it. And the, you know, if you throw it to something, you know, if you try to create a distraction and there are at least two guards there, you might find that they'll cover each other. Like, they'll, you know, they'll turn their backs on each other so that one of them is looking where the sound, you know, where they heard the, the noise and the other one is looking to, to make sure that no one comes up behind the back of the first one. So, yeah, you can't just throw something and then go after, you know, and do, you know, take out one of the people and then afterwards distract the other and then take him out the way you could before. So, yeah. So again, you know, forcing you to be more creative in, in that. You get an arc prediction when you are about to throw, and you can always cancel throwing. You know, you can you can get the arc prediction and say, I'm not gonna throw anyway, and then cancel it. You can hide in cabinets, which works as a checkpoint save when you, you know when you can save. You can't save when you're, you know, being... Like, if, if the guards in the area are looking for you or looking for something, 
then you can't save, period. But, you know, there are times where you also can't save manually where you'll be able to checkpoint save. And, yeah, hiding in a cabinet will accomplish that. And you can move slowly out of a cabinet or you can, you know, rush out of it. And unfortunately, unlike Hitman Absolution, you cannot, like, hide a body in there. You know, th those you always have to just put in a corner or put in a dark area and the like. And, you know, typically in this, you can't tell who's saying something. You, you know, you, you can hear the line fairly clearly, you know, which, you know, some say that, you know, regardless of how far away, not quite true. It, you know, if you're very close to the person, it's clearly, excuse me, in, you know, increased in volume. If you're, if you move away from the area, you no longer can hear them and the volume will decrease as you get further away. Again, I'm not saying they didn't experience it. I'm saying I didn't. And... There, there do appear to be bugs in that, you know, regard, but I didn't encounter them at all. And the, or, yeah, I already mentioned whether, which I encountered and which not. Yeah, it's, it's just, there, there are times where you're inside the building and you can hear someone talk but you can't see them and like you will never be able to see them because they're on a different floor that you can't access for example it's just yeah it it's a little yeah it's a little annoying that you typically can't see who's talking you you overhear conversations constantly and can't tell. And sometimes it is important for you to be able to tell, you know, who's, you know, because again, sometimes it's one of those convenient conversations and you need to watch who's going to be walking away and where they walk to, to, you know, help you determine if this person is returning to a guard post, if they're on a patrol, what exactly is, yeah. The, the guards do not make noise in this, which is, yeah, a, that was something that the, the first three does immensely well. You know, you can always hear when there is a guard and, you know, you can use the noise to, long before you see a guard you can say okay he's like around that corner or whatever he's gonna cough he's gonna clear his throat he's gonna whistle whatever you can always hear that there's a guard there and in this like in Dishonored they don't make any noise in this however I fairly rarely like accidentally like if you stick to the shadows you usually will be able to tell where a guard is without accidentally revealing where you are. And a number of them will, you know, be walking around with a torch, like in the third one. And again, if you stick to the shadows and you very closely watch the amount of light in your surroundings, you will be able to tell when a torch is approaching. Like, again, let's say you, you know, he comes from around the corner. You'll be able to see the torch hit the, the wall, you know. Yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see the light as it goes around the corner before he has a chance to light up where you are. And you just have to, you know, quickly but quietly get away from where he is going and then, you know, yeah, find a hiding spot or go into, you know, or just prepare yourself to knock him out. Get to a place where he won't be able to see you, but maybe he'll pass you with the torch and then knock him out. You know, you have options. 
and the there is an ability there is a focus ability called see footsteps but yeah like the rune ability in dishonored you really shouldn't have to and there definitely are times where lips aren't synced up to the, this is especially true in like some of the cutscenes and some of the very scripted events where you're just waiting for something to happen where you can't actually do anything in that situation and certainly subtitles will suddenly be too far ahead or too behind or the like now there aren't that many things that change how much noise you're making which again is a huge aspect of the first three you know basically carpet makes no noise wood makes some stone makes even more and marble is just really noisy and this is whether or not you're walking on it whether or not you throw something onto it to distract and such and if you're moving extremely slowly you know, like wood still won't particularly make noise, stone might, marble will. So avoid the marble or the like. In this, you know, there are still some carpets and those mar mask noise almost, almost consistently. But otherwise, you know, if you're walking on wood, it will make more noise than the carpet. Other than that, you know, it's the very clearly noisy surfaces is like broken glass and water and something that's also an issue with there now being that few and such is that those two you can't do anything about where yeah you know when you deal with marble for example you can cover it in moss with the moss arrows and those there, there are no moss arrows in this at all and yeah, it's just, you don't have a, you just, you, you have to wait until the the guards are too far away to particularly hear you, you have to run right after you make the noise, or you just have to find another path. It's just, it's too bad to not have that extra option. The, and this does very much have the cat and mouse thing going. And you know you're you're sneaking from place to place, and the 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 goal is of course to be able to sneak into a place, steal whatever you're there to steal, and then sneak back out. You know, not being noticed until it's too late for them to do anything about it. And the guards no longer have, you know, the the two voices, the really stupid guy who has the you know the the dumb guy voice of like a Saturday morning cartoon villain right hand man and then the other guard being you know smart and always correcting the other guy and being like really annoyed at having to explain these you know I I admit that those are among the sillier elements of the the thief trilogy but I do so love I I'm okay with them having replaced it but I I do quite like them nevertheless and the you can ghost your way through basically all of this you know th there are a few times where you're forced to like run or the like but the 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 rest of it you get to ghost through and that is almost all of it. there's almost nothing where you have to actually run there are times where the 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 guards know that you're in the area you can still ghost you can still avoid meeting them at all you can yeah that I quite like that and yeah I do of course prefer that you can play the whole thing without them ever really knowing 
that you're there until the until you've completed the level and then you know they might notice that some things are missing and such the the game is most fun when you play very slowly and in that case it's immensely tense you can save any time basically you know again there are like if if you've just been noticed or if you are in a fight then you can't save but any other time you know yeah and as many times as you want and such it's fun to kind of play like a ninja gradually taking out one enemy after another although you know again if you're not noticed at all you're likely to only be knocking them out I'll get more into that you'll often you know and some of the most fun is trawling right behind an enemy maybe picking his pocket which you know actually works here you know it's not like in Assassin's Creed 3 words yeah and yeah you know the there are a ton of stealth options in this although some have pointed out that there are times where it's extremely easy and other times where it seems impossible you can lean you know in, in any direction o only now only you know like over edges when you're at the edge and around like you know if you if you're in cover yeah you can be be like yeah leaning around that and the the cover again these are the same people who did or at least the same overall company that did human revolution and you can really tell the the fact that the cover system in in human revolution it works immensely well for hiding as well you know in in that game you know part of the stealth is this this kind of line of sight thing but you're always moving from cover to cover when you're being stuck you know almost always so yeah you 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 don't feel like powerless rather you feel very capable in that situation you're just waiting for someone to turn around or you know go on a patrol path stop their patrol you know and then you move right around i wish this allowed the same basic cover because here it really is only the very edge you can grab on and then you can look around because sometimes in this you can actually move from like when when there's a box here and here and you're peeking around here you can go over to the other one just like in the human revolution and where it works immensely well there here it's very rare and yeah i again i i think that's something that could have translated very well to this as well the most of the buildings that you break into are empty so yeah you know again part of the fun was getting to just you know sneak into a place and you know maybe there are party guests you know passed out on the marble floor maybe someone is asleep in their bed maybe there's a guard outside the door that you need to get into and you had to deal with that and here yeah you can run around in these empty buildings and no one will notice you can throw bodies as well as just drop them and the like splinter cell in this sometimes you're sneaking you know a portion without knowing where you're actually going and that is kind of annoying you know it's yeah you the the when you're sneaking from place to place you shouldn't be like really confused about where to go so you're spending a lot of time and effort sneaking in a certain direction and then it turns out that was actually the wrong direction to go in that yeah prefer when stealth games don't do that In this, you learn the secrets of the city. 
like Assassin's Creed, you know, you can tell that, you know, again, the same company did Tomb Raider and, you know, the, the reboot. I've hardly played any Tomb Raider, but just, yeah, the fact that you're, you know, going around ruins and such. To be fair, you know, you're also going around mazes and ruins in, you know, six out of the in in a roughly yeah in in a good in in a third of the thief one levels and you know there the big difference between this and you know and and yeah the you know thief two and thief three there's always been, you know, mazes, ruins, and, and such in Thief. Something that you can really tell the difference here is there aren't really much... There, there, are, there are almost no supernatural creatures. I'm not going to give away exactly... yeah. And they are all over the, you know, the mazes, the ruins, and caverns and such in the the trilogy. And yeah, it it makes a substantial difference because it's just not as interesting to be running around these places when there's nothing you have to to deal with. I'll get more into that later on. And. Um, this just has, you know, more detailed plot, and the loot doesn't matter quite as much. That's, you know, other than that, it bears similarity to the trilogy in that. Now, the, the city itself is actually named the city. It's not just, you know, instead of calling it by its name. And it's this mix of Victorian, Gothic, and steampunk. You know, it's, it's kind of Middle Ages and early industrialism. And it actually gets the industrialism across better than Thief 3. And, yeah, the as dark as this gets, the world is just not as brutal as in Thief 1 and 2, and I've already gone into some detail about that. The score and sound side in general really fits the mood. You now have a, in, you know, your, your hideout is in the clock tower above the city, and you have a, you know, you have these display cases for the most spectacular loot you've stolen and you can also stash like you know various arrows and equipment you know supplies basically and yeah this is too streamlined some say that this is to this game is to the thief franchise what Deus Ex Invisible War was to Deus Ex some saying some Others say that's going too far. Others say that's not going too far enough. I'd say it's going a little too far. And yeah, you, I've already mentioned, you know, you can tell that this is the same overall, at least company that made Deus Ex Human Revolution. There are some style similarities and some of them just made more sense in, you know, four. A Deus Ex game. Now, I've read that this has better boss battles than Deus Ex Human Revolution. It's been too long since I played for me to really comment on the boss battles in that. But yeah, there are indeed boss battles in this stealth game. <sighs> I read one review that said it was the worst boss battles, you know, in any game ever, you know, hyperbole and the internet go hand in hand. I don't know that they're the worst, but they're not 
good. They're a bit too... It's... They're, they're too... It's not so much that they're challenging, it's the fact that it's basically a single tiny mistake. You know, the... Yeah, the, the boss insta-kills, so you... Yeah, literally one tiny mistake, and that's it. Something that I do think is well worth noting in this is that, like, you know, I already mentioned how you can ghost through basically everything other than a few forced parkour sequences and such. You can ghost your way through boss battles in this. That's really, I mean, like, it's not that the other individual doesn't know that you're there. But you can leave without them. You, know, you, you can accomplish what you're there to accomplish without them realizing that you've done so. Again, until it's too late for them to do anything about it. So, yeah, I greatly appreciate that. Whenever you have this kind of In, in a stealth game where you, you know, you're going out of your way not to fight, which is not always, the, you know, not every stealth game is about not fighting. Some of them are just about making sure that you're not seen at the wrong time. Like Assassin's Creed, there's still plenty of fighting. It's just, you know, if you're seen in specific areas, they might have a hostage that they'll kill, or there might just be too many, and they might kill you. And you have to get into another area where you'll only fight a few, or the like. You know, that can work. You don't, it's, it's not that every stealth game has you not fighting, has you avoiding fighting. But when a stealth game does have you, you know, when, when you get the best rating, or, you know, you get more money, or the like, for not fighting, and you're basically, the, the game is encouraging you to not fight, and then suddenly you actually do have to fight, that is, you know, that's, that's a problem in a lot of stealth games. Hitman Contracts, the third Hitman game, does very well at that, actually. The final mission of Hitman Contracts is challenging. You, you're in a hotel room. There's a SWAT team on the way. They're, they're like literally on the stairs. The, the hotel itself is surrounded. Everyone in the vicinity knows that you're there. Like, the place has been, you know... Yeah, there, there are police and SWAT everywhere, and they are all just waiting for, you know, yeah, for, for you to be taken out. They are specifically waiting for that. It's possible to only kill the one person, the, the police inspector who's organized this entire attack, because he knows too much about you, and... Yeah, that's, that's a problem, and you're going to solve that problem. You can kill only him and leave the level without anyone realizing that you've killed him, that you've left the hotel. Again, before, you know, it's too late. That is awesome, and I really wish that it wasn't only the third one out of the five Hitman games that have come out. I, I have hopes, high hopes for the new one, you know, Hitman trademarked, because let's not put any distinguishing subtitle or number, I, I can understand why no number is the sixth one by now, and maybe they're worried that they'll accidentally, you know, we have Hitman Silent Assassin, which the Silent Assassin is then the rating that you can get in 
the games following, in including Silent Assassin. Then you have Hitman Contracts, and then in Absolution you have a Contracts mode. So maybe they're just worried that they'll accidentally title something that makes, you know, communicating about it confusing again. But it still would really rock if you could, yeah, if, if they could achieve that again. In this, they actually pretty much do. You in in the boss battles, you can pretty much you can pretty much do what you're supposed to do to to either win the boss battle or you know maybe you just sneak through the situation. You're not forced to do anything that the rest of the game has been explicitly telling you not to do. And I'm not going to give any details, at least in this video. I made in the thoughts video. But yeah, I, I am, I think that's very, very nicely done. That, actually, that might be one of the things there is about Deus Ex Human Revolution. I played through that game stealthy and non-lethal. I was yeah, there was there was no time where I was like noticed or where I just ran into a firefight. I killed I I tried to kill almost no one. I think I don't remember I think I might have accidentally killed well, accidentally. I might have wound up killing at least one person. But yeah, I went for that and then suddenly you're in a boss battle and you're expected to be able to kill this other I I think that was the case in that and again I don't remember them being like you know I mean when a boss battle is bad it is bad like it can be just intolerable but yeah I'm, I'm not sure they were that bad but it, it is that thing of suddenly you have to fight when yeah and yeah and this ultimately you don't really have to do anything that you haven't at all had to do before this point. Now, everything about this feels pretty rushed, and the game feels rushed out, hence the technical issues that many have run into, and like I said, even I ran into a few of them, and even without that, I mean, we've got this this dialogue repetition and some bad acting. These, you know, clearly they rushed through it. You know, there was like a deadline that they were determined to meet. You know, they they were out of beta, releasing on time, and just somewhere along the way there wasn't quite enough testing done. And yeah, now the. Because of the the sequences pretty much all being scripted, and a lot of them not having that many enemies, unlike you know that's that's part of it. Blacklist is a lot of fun to replay for playstyles and such because there is so much variety, and here there just isn't as much. And part of it is also that it's just not as much fun to go in killing everyone because in blacklist it's literally the difference between going in guns blazing throwing explosive grenades planting mines you know blowing people away with a desert eagle knifing one person after another even after you've been noticed and then you know just Yeah, just knifing the the you know knifing people without having been noticed, and either knocking out or preferably entirely avoiding the enemies that you encounter, just sneaking past them without them ever knowing you are there again until it's too late. And here it's just you know it's it's very difficult to really get away with very much violence. If, if you're seen, you probably want to run. And I'm not saying that, that that can sometimes be fun and exciting, but 
yeah, when you replay, it's just, you're not necessarily going to, you, you don't just go in and attack everyone you can. You know, in, in Splinter Cell, in, in Blacklist, as long as you're playing it tactical, as long as you're, like, making sure to take cover, changing position every so often, you know, things like that, you can blow away everyone. And that's a lot of fun, you know. And, and it's still challenging and not impossible. In this, you just ultimately can't. And you, Thief has never really allowed for that. It's just, that's just not the game that it is. You know, again, Deus Ex. In, in all three, you can go in, you can kill everyone. You can sneak in and try to affect as few as possible. It's, it, yeah, you, you can... And, and it's just, that's just not quite the case with Thief. It never really has. And so, instead, you know, you do have, you know, there's one of the play styles, yeah, you, you use violence. But it's just, it's just not the same as the way you use violence in Blacklist. And it just, yeah, it makes a really big difference for replaying. You can more or less snipe with the bow and then, you know, change positions and then, you know, you're, yeah, you know, you, you know, try to kind of like sniper elite kind of it, you know, which isn't even entirely true of sniper elite itself. Yeah. I've, you know, anything I say about Sniper Elite is going to be about the first two, and yeah, I I played the first two, and I probably won't be playing the third one, because they're just not, they just don't quite live up to their, you know, concept, and in general, they're just not as good as they should be. Now, you may want to manually save before you go to into a new place. There is like slightly glowing blue like metal grates and such and white paint in areas that kind of indicate where you're supposed to go and they they help you figure that out and yeah, some have found them annoying and they definitely do kind of you know stand out. Now I personally found the controls fairly responsive and, you know, reasonably intuitive. It, there are a few too many separate commands, which I will get more into. But other than that, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you don't break a bone in your hand every time you try to do an unusual, you know, yeah. Some, something unusual. Others have found them to be, yeah, just, yeah, not, not at all intuitive and unresponsive and, yeah. Not all the glitters is gold, but everything you can interact with this, within this, pretty much, is easy to recognize. You know, if you can read something you know, if, if you see a piece of paper with where there's clearly some text on it or an open book, yeah, you can, you know, you're likely to be able to go up and you can read it, you can store what you've read, and they're all good reads, short reads. Again, Dishonored, they got way too long, way too frequent, and it got tedious, and... No, it is not the developer, it is not the, the players, you know, yes, you can choose just not to read all of it, but it's not the player's responsibility to stop doing a certain action because it gets tedious. It's the developer's responsibility to make sure that it doesn't get tedious, again, if they want their product praised. And, yeah, you know, even when, like, there's... There are times in this where there are a ton of things to read. They're never too long. They're, you know, you never feel like you're just 
reading something that you basically already knew and just yeah and you know loot tends to glint especially when as you get close to it and the things that you can pick up store and throw tend to be drinking glasses you know bottles of you know yeah stuff you could drink and if you you know if there's something that you could shoot to distract it'll be like a vase or the like if there's something you can shoot to affect the you know the environment in in another way it'll be like an axle or something else that really attracts your attention and when you just look around a place and looking for things to steal even if you're not close enough for the the glint effect yeah the it it will yeah it'll it'll be like bronze you know gold silver something like that or yeah something that just looks really expensive of course there are times where you'll find stuff like this in the trash of poor people's homes which makes no sense whatsoever but you know it's like jewelry no longer vases those are for distracting small stacks of coins entire paintings and such you you steal a lot but most of them really don't you know aren't very expensive so it yeah that gets to be kind of annoying you you just have to steal one thing after another and ultimately it still doesn't really amount to that much although i will say that in this there's stuff you you know you will end up spending you know there will always be something you can almost always be something you can pretty much always be something you could spend your money on where in the third one i ran around with you know, pockets full of cash, a ton of loot that I didn't even want to bother selling because what was I going to use it on? So, yeah. And it seems like, yeah, I'm, I'm almost certain you cannot check the same container like twice. Like if you're opening a drawer, when you've clicked use to check it, you can't check that one again unless you're replaying like a side mission or a mission or the like. And, you know, you haven't done it on this play through. When it comes to doors, you can straight up, you know, actually, you know, open them without necessarily going through them, close them. And it's now easy to tell if you'll be closing a door without going through, you know, to the other side. Like, if you'll be closing the door and staying inside the same room. But, yeah. You know, when it comes to drawers, you'll typically open the drawer all the way, take, you know, if there's only one piece of loot, you'll take that one piece and then, you know, automatically, and then he'll close it again. If there's more than one piece, then you take them one by one, and then he'll just leave the drawer open. Windows, it tends to be that, you know, the, you know, you, you open it all the way, you know, if you maybe, maybe you have to pick a lock to open it, then you press use a bunch to get it to, to open, then you climb through the window and then you close it behind you. So, you know, unlike before, you cannot do any one part of that and then hide because the patrol is coming back or the like. And I love how some reviewers complained that in this, what you loot immediately turns into cash. Whereas you can only store one thing to, to throw, to distract. Because, you know, that isn't true of every video game ever released that has, on one hand, things that you can pick up, and on the other, things that you pick up and then use. You know, it, yeah, it's typically when you pick a bunch of things up that eventually become like an extra life, you don't have to go to a place and buy that extra life they just become and yet you know you can't store as many you know yeah it's yeah there's there's yeah anyway with it's already been pointed out this doesn't really deliver anything new and 
if you're gonna get it, definitely don't get it at full price. Get it on sale. It is not worth full price. In this, you you know, when you encounter a painting or a, a you know a bookcase or the like, you may be able to feel along like you know there might be a specific book that you can pull out and it'll you know activate something there might be a switch on you know along the edge at, at least one along the edge of the painting and if you you know do it right then maybe it'll open to a safe that you then have to find or figure out the code for or a hidden door or something and this really makes you feel like a thief to be doing this with you know with just your fingertips now you you know there are these levers that you're gonna be pulling and wheels that you're gonna be turning and you know these these do make up mostly simple puzzles where in, in Splinter Cell Blacklist, even replaying side missions, you can go for playstyles. In this, you can't really, but certainly in missions, yeah, you can go for the various playstyles. And you can't just grind these for money, which I think you actually can in, in Blacklist. Which is a little, you know, there are a ton of things to buy, but it is still, you know, yeah, you can just complete... The, the same, yeah, I, I believe, again, it's it's been a while. In this, you only get the difference between what you looted before and, you know, what you looted this time. Or if, you know, you might get, like, some extra if you achieve a an optional objective that you didn't before. And, yeah. You know, the, the three are Ghost, Opportunist, and Predator. And Ghost is indeed ghosting through the game. You know, you, were, you weren't you were seen, you didn't affect the environment, and yeah, just completely without leaving a, a trace except, you know, stealing things and such. Opportunist means that you do affect the environment, like, you know, you put out a bunch of light sources, or you use, you know, you distract, you use the environment to your advantage. And Predator does indeed mean that you knock out, most likely, or kill everyone you come across. Or, you know, most of the people. You, you go out of your way to knock out or kill. And yes, you do indeed get to keep whatever weapons and, you know, special arrows and such that, you know, when you go back and replay something, you don't have to just go by what you had access to the first time you played it. So, yeah, that's, that's quite nice. And, yeah, this adds replayability. You, in this, have focus vision, which highlights loot and security systems, things you can interact with in general. And you use poppies to refill it, and again, you're not forced to use it. It, you know, you can consider it like a hint system. If you're just, if you're stuck and you feel like just, you know, use it once, you can just use it that one time just briefly to get you a little further, and yeah, if you refuse to use it, yeah, it doesn't force you to. You can also still zoom with your eye, and unlike Dishonored, it does not increase the volume of what you are, you know, yeah, whatever you're looking directly at. And the, you know, the vision is this blue, kind of sort of night vision e kind of yeah you know it puts that filter over things it can also help you you know improve your attacks slow down time and such 
others have already pointed out that the powers with it are somewhat useless and there is no experience point you know element in this you do you may find some points you know focus points for for vision along the way otherwise you have to just buy them and that yeah you know it's just yeah it's it's not and you know any focus point that you have you can use to unlock the ability right where you are but yeah you know the RPG elements in this are not very good you you could not upgrade in the first two thief games and you know yeah RPG elements were not you know today they're calm they're they're in most games you know and stealth also wasn't as firmly established back then but today when that is you know that has changed theoretically it does make sense to bring in these yeah there are eight different powers and you know one point to each you know we're in dishonored a you know you might have to spend several runes on one power in this it's one to one and there are two levels to each so you know you can buy it once and then use it you can upgrade it once then and then you have the full level of that one and yes the you know they are all there are some passive ones but any that you use you use you know via the you know focus the, the vision eye thing you know there you you can't like activate some of them and not others kind of yeah and the you know i i buy most dlc for you know when i get games i yeah i often buy the dlc and especially if it's on sale and both it and the game itself were on sale with the money that i got in the booster packs i was actually able to i didn't actually do it but i yeah, I could tell that, well, you know, I did it and then I loaded, so I, yeah. I could have bought six of these focus points before starting mission two. That's a bit, yeah. Now, they don't really fully allow you to tailor, you know, tailor them for your preferred playstyle you will have to prepare before you go on a mission or side mission you cannot buy during it and you know if if you find that you just need to get something you can always leave go back to the city but you will lose any progress you made so yeah again consequence you have to actually make sure that you prepare yourself arrows are rare and yeah you you if you go in expecting to find what you need, you are going to be disappointed. You can get some equipment, including the wrench, which really looks more like a screwdriver. I don't know if they, like, you know, accidentally, they, they wrote, you know, add a wrench to the and then the design guys actually made it a screwdriver and nobody ever got around to change you know rushed so yeah it allows you to you know open gratings which you can then you know yeah allowing for vent crawling and it also allows you to get certain collectibles that might be stuck on walls and such and you know this is of course referred to as unscrew which is an ability i'm sure many young women would like to be able to uh, it's it's funny because some guys are willing to manipulate women emotionally 
in order to have sex with them, which the woman might end up paying for for a long time, possibly her entire life, whereas the guy gets off in more ways than one. I know, I know, that has absolutely nothing to do with this game. I, I just, I can't help interjecting, you know, my, my opinions on social issues and politics in these videos, even when it has nothing to do with, with anything. It's, I, I, I may have, like, SG, SGW Tourette's or something. Don't you just love how fighting for social justice is supposed to be a negative? I'm going to try to stop. Then there's the wire cutter, which diffuses traps at their control panel, and the razor blade, which is what you use to steal paintings. You, you know, that was something that, in the third one, you can just steal them whole, and it's like, how exactly are you doing that? But in this, you see him cut along the, the sides, you know, and, you know, a razor blade goes with the whole goth emo thing. And, you know, yeah, he takes off the, and, you know, yeah, he can, you know, he can just, you know, like, roll it up, and, yeah, and shout up wherever he puts all the, the jewelry and silverware that he also steals, you know, it still doesn't make complete sense, but him just straight up grabbing an entire painting off the wall is still a little... Yeah, even if it's not so much about space, just him grabbing it off, you know, it, of course he can cut it out from the frame with a razor blade, that makes sense. Now, yes, the, the, yeah, these, using these tools and, you know, getting them really makes you feel like a thief. You you have to actively buy these three tools. Of course, it's not difficult to tell what you're going to really need because the things you can buy that aren't just these tools are basically supplies and boons and then, you know, like more like armor and, you know, you can upgrade your various, you know, yeah, how you how many errors you can carry at a time and and such and again these in theory these are good but they just end up not changing that much and just yeah i i personally didn't get very many of them i yeah it's yeah and it it didn't make a huge difference and yeah, you really should be able to tell the difference of whether or not you upgrade and what you upgrade and unlock and such. There are not that many places where you can use special arrows. You can no longer reuse rope arrows, but when you fire a rope arrow, it will stay hanging there. You know, if you, you know, this is especially noticeable in the city hub because in, you know, missions, once you've done the mission, next time you play it, you're going to have to do the same thing. But in the city hub, any rope that you attach, it's going to be there. You know, you can do it before, you know, before starting mission two. And then, you know, once, you know, and you can check back before you complete the last mission and it'll still be there. And you now also have the claw. I'm going to spare you a terrible imitation of a Jim Carrey bit which allows you to basically extend your reach just a little bit to, you know, climb a little bit higher up so you can, you know, reach higher than you would be able to just standing and reaching as far as you can with your arms. And the, you know, where in, in the Thief Trilogy, you can, you know, you have gas arrows, gas mines, gas bombs, and flash bombs. So basically, you know, you can shoot something that has, that'll knock them out. You can plant something that'll knock them out. And you can throw something at them that'll knock them out. And the same is true in Blacklist. In this, you do still have the, the, gas arrow and flash bombs, but the gas arrow works the same as the flash bomb now. It only stuns them temporarily. 
So yeah, you'll want to deal with them or run. And excuse me, the which is again that's yeah, it's it's a viable like if you have to run past a, a small group of guards, you can fire at least one gas arrow and run past them and yeah, it'll take them a few seconds before they'll be able to follow you. And yeah, same for a flash bomb and also just if you're if you were noticed or you're being attacked or something and you just want to run flash bomb them or fire a you know, in that situation you'll probably flash bomb them. You won't want to get out an arrow and slowly aim and yeah. But yeah, the and and the 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 flash bomb now you throw directly to the ground, similar to the smoke bombs of Assassin's Creed, where before you could not aim them so much like the way you can other things, but you could throw them further away, or you know, you could drop them to the ground, throw them a little further away, you could throw them several feet at least. Now he just you know does the the you know ninja disappearing in smoke thing and just you know drops it to the ground. You now have a badass compact bow, which again helps explain why you can run around with it and do all these jumps and this, yeah, all this stuff without you know the bow coming off. So, yeah, and the, you know, it, it'll, you know, in the seconds that you, you know, once you draw it, the time you spend fully drawing it and just, you know, a second or two after the, the circle that, you know, the moment that you have the, the bow out, you get a circle and it will get smaller and smaller the longer you hold it drawn until a few seconds after where it'll just, you know, you'll completely lose, which is what happens. You know, if you try to actually tighten a bow, if you hold it too long, suddenly you won't be real good at, yeah, you know, aiming it anymore. And it, you know, in the, in the first three, it just zooms in. And yeah, this again really helps making it more clear what you're going to hit and such, yeah. And others have pointed out that using the bow isn't quite polished. Now, but but yeah, you can ready the bow very quickly, and if you just want to fire, if you're not going to care too much about sending it very far flying, or too much, if you're just firing in a direction, then you can, you know, that you can do in a second or two, you know, draw it and then fire really, really quickly the you know the the choke arrow which is the name for the gas arrow can now also put out fire by you know choking it of air and it is th this arrow is substantially more common than it was before probably because it no longer just instantly knocks out you know before the 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 gas weaponry was more limited because it's really really effective and it makes your job too easy if you're just constantly able to use it. So yeah, and the you know yeah you you also had the water arrow that you know useful for putting out torches and such you know fire arrows which no longer act as a rocket you know you can use them to set fire to all oil patches which again are not that frequent. And, you know, the, yeah, there, there are the sawtooth arrows, which are very effective against, you know, the, yeah, it, it pierces armor. You know, it's more useful than the regular arrow at killing. And, yeah, you'll want to only use it when you really need to and such. I should mention the, the fire arrow can also be really useful against some heavier enemies and yeah it'll it might set fire to an enemy so yeah 
and you can now buy blunt arrows which are very cheap and can be used for affecting the environment you know there were some things you could do to with arrows to affect the environment in you know the trilogy but now that's much more common and so you get these very cheap arrows that are purely for that you know you don't want to use a blunt arrow to hit someone you know it literally blunt you know it's purely for it's it's like a really you know it's an extension of your index finger and yeah you know it's it's just for pressing that button or you know punching that thing that you need to knock yeah that metaphor did not use it quite as well as i had hoped you no longer have the moss arrow, which I already described. Well, I guess I could describe again. Basically, it makes a small patch of moss, and if you fire like a bunch of these in, you know, a row, you can make an entire path. And you can sometimes you'll just be using one, but yeah, it'll make, you know, it'll render silent whatever surface it lands on, which is not the entire. You know, yeah, it's it's a small patch, and sometimes they could be very unpredictable because it lands and then it kind of throws out the moss, and sometimes it doesn't land close. But yeah, and the noisemaker arrows, which are indeed, you know, they they cause they they have some visual thing, you know, they make noise, therefore distractions. Now you use the blunt arrows for distractions, which means that you can only use them in the places that the game wants you to be able to distract you know as far as arrows you can always throw a throwable it's just that you know you only you can only carry the one so yeah but yeah it's it's a good yeah you know the in spite of getting rid of those two very useful arrows. They have, you know, added several that are also very useful. You know, I, the, the Sawtooth is very, very nice for taking out more powerful enemies and making sure that you kill with like one hit instead of, because the moment you fire an arrow at someone, you're going to be noticed and you may not want that guy to survive that first hit and yeah, it you know, and some of them wear helmets and armor, so yeah. And the then you have the blast arrow, which is somewhat like the the rocket nature of the fire arrow in at least the first two games. And yeah, it does a good amount of damage. And yeah, now when you ready your bow, when you draw, you know, you'll have a visual indicator of whether you'll hit and whether it'll affect the you know the the thing you can affect will kind of you know there there will be a little extra circle around it and again you can always cancel it i i covered that slightly but just to add some more detail to that and the the hud tends to be fairly minimalist but when you get out some something to use it will you know it will bring up everything you have the every supply thing you have otherwise it's just you know the the mini radar with with a compass and you know the the health meter which is pretty rare today actually and the focus you know the how much energy you have for that that's pretty much that's it for what's always there and the you yeah, where in the first two is Carmen San Diego no in the first two games you can store you know you buy from level to level and anything you had even at the end of one level you do not get to carry over to the next so you have to loot if you want to buy, be able to buy much in the next level and it means that 
they they get to choose what they can sell you. So if they don't want you to have very many or even any of a specific kind of arrow or the like in the next level, they're just it's not going to be in the store. And yeah, if you don't loot very much, you're not going to be able to buy that much. And no matter what, you'll never be able to buy everything in, you know, in between, you know, for the next level. You'll never be able to get that much loot in any level that you can buy everything they're offering for the next level. So there's always making that choice. What do I need in this next level? In the third and this, you keep the arrows and supplies that you have between levels. So you 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 know there there are two different ways of having consequences to that you know you you know that you don't have to buy new ones for the next level if you don't really spend any and you know that you know and it it also means that if you you know if you use a lot you will indeed have to like you will have some arrows in at the start of the level even if you didn't buy any like if you don't buy any like and it'll even tell you in in the store in in thief one and two you'll be able to see what you already have even before you buy anything and you'll basically always have some standard arrows some broad hit arrows in this if you use up all your arrows and then you don't buy any new ones that's it you yeah so you can choose to save up over a long period of the game if you want to buy something very expensive and you know you want just that. If you try to use almost no arrows and maybe even sell ones you don't need, that will make, yeah, you'll be able to slowly gather more and more wealth. That is one RPG element here that isn't in the first two that really works. And again, wasn't really necessary in the third one because you're just you're not going to need that much. I, I don't know if they just expected me to go through every level just firing an arrow every time there was anything I could fire that arrow at, pretty much. But, I mean, it's still a game that encourages you to, you know, ghost your way through it. So, yeah, anyway. And the, you know you still have the blackjack from knocking out and it's pretty much entirely silent and you can in this and in the third you can see when it'll work but unlike the third where you constantly have if you move at regular speed they'll hear you so you have to you know slowly walk but they walk faster so you have to constantly okay can I do that nope it didn't respond okay and now finally you know in this yeah it actually you don't find yourself in that situation and in this you can actually do it to someone who's asleep even if if you're in front of them you can click the button and he will actually do it where in the first two you have to do it from behind it, I believe in the in the third as, as well you know you gotta hit it from behind it's mandatory and yeah in this you can even do it on someone who's sitting down which is very very difficult and you know thankfully in the first two especially they hardly ever have anyone sitting down so it's not like you just have to pass that guy if you, even if you want it to knock him out in this nobody who's sitting down if, you know if they're sitting down you st of course have to worry about if you know are they actually asleep are they sitting down asleep or would they notice you if you walk into the light but you can be behind them and it'll work and if you're on you know not on their side because you're obviously against them or you wouldn't be hitting them you know unless you come from that kind of family if you're at their side and they yeah if you're next to them and close enough that you should be able to knock them out and you can't get behind them if they have their back against the wall again before you wouldn't be able to do anything at least with your blackjack in that exact situation now he can and it makes sense because they still you know, I mean, even if like the the it's only this, you know, kind of like front half of my face. If you come with a you know like metal object, and I don't see you in time to react, and you hit me in that part of, it's still gonna knock me out. You don't have to hit in the back of the head for for that. You know, trust me, I've tried. And the you know. 
In this, it now takes about a second or two. So if you are very close, if you know, if, if there are two guys and you knock out one of them, because he's gonna do it and then kind of grab him and then let him slowly fall, which makes a lot of sense because if he just falls, one, it might make noise, two, he might actually die from the impact, which is not the idea here. So yeah, if there are two, for one thing, he might notice before you're done putting away his buddy. For another, he might have had time to walk away, walk into light, turn around something. So knock one out and then run, you know, if, if that's what you're going to be doing. I don't think, I never had one wake back up, you know, even ones that seem to have been found by enemies. So I don't think that's something that happens in this. Thankfully, you know, unlike like commandos, which to be fair in commandos, you can usually deal with that. But yeah, in in these in the thief games, when someone's knocked out, they stay knocked out, which really makes you wonder why Erin is so worried about that. But yeah, maybe she's pointing out that it's a little bit strange that they never. Although you know, Garrett's response to her is, "When they wake up, I'm far. You know, I'm I'm, you know, I've I'm long gone." Yeah, in in this, you know, I, I compare this to in Assassin's Creed 1. You cannot fence using the wrist blade. Because why would you? It's attached to your wrist, it's a small blade. If you do this over and over, it's gonna snap off. But then from second you know, from the second game and onwards, you know, and you have two because that's that's cooler. Okay, to be fair, that is cooler, but somehow you can fence with it, which makes no sense. In, in the first one, if you want to fence at short range, you have to equip your dagger, you know. And before this one in Thief, you could not fight with your blackjack. It was useless once they knew you were there. In this, you know, you, you hit, this is where the Batman thing comes into it. You hit them in the face, and you can dodge, and then you hit them in the face, and... Yeah, you know, the the... Fighting has always been a problem in Thief. Always, from, from, from the start. And the... I, I should briefly go more into... Yeah. It's not quite quick time event. You can move freely. But it's basically copy-pasting, you know... You can tell they're about to attack, so you dodge. Then you hit. If you were unlucky, they might have blocked your hit, then, you know, you're probably going to need to dodge again. Then you can maybe hit them. You can usually only get one hit in before they're going to attack, and then you got to dodge again. And, yeah, it's just, it's not very interesting. You, you definitely don't want to turn your back on an enemy. If he gets too close to you, he knows you're there, he will run you through, and that's insta-kill. But... Yeah, and you use it by pressing R and V, which is less comfortable than, say, the mouse, you know, left and right mouse buttons. And it's because you can't actually equip the, you know, yeah, you, you cannot equip the, the blackjack in this. And thus you cannot choose, you know, you, you can activate it when it'll work. You, you can always hit with it. It's just that mostly when you hit with it, it's going to be when you're fighting. And yeah, I just, I wish that, like, how about this? Pressing V means equipping the blackjack. And then, you know, left mouse button, hit, right mouse button, dodge. That would be much more comfortable. And then you just press the V button if you want to try to run or something. You can barely fight anyone. You know, what I found out was that if you manage to get into, you know, get your back against, like, like do the 300 thing, lure them into it so, so that basically you'll only face one, maybe two at a time. Because otherwise, if there's, you know, if there's three or more, you are dead. You are not going to be able to dodge all of them and hit all of them. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, in the first two Thief games, you have a sword. 
you can hit with that, you can parry, you know, block with it, and you don't have to use, you know, if, if you haven't been seen, you just use the blackjack. Then the third one, they replace it with a dagger, which makes sense for a thief who doesn't want to kill anybody, but you can't block with that, so suddenly, you know, fighting is just and, and there's only the one attack move, so, you know, in, in the first two, you can attack, you can attack from either side. You can draw it, you know, and really hammer down on them, although it takes a few seconds, so you maybe don't, you know, it's maybe taking a risk, you know. But then in this, there is no blocking, you can only dodge, and you don't have a dagger or, a, you know, a, a sword, although... Apparently, according to the, like, he does apparently have a small knife, according to the, the comics, but anyway, I guess I should briefly, if you, if you look at this game and you feel like this, you know, if you haven't bought it yet, and you look at this game and you're like, That's lo that looks really good, I'm totally going to get into this, and you read, you know, some negative reviews and you still, like, I'm going to get into this, in that case, sure, go ahead and get the Master Edition. There are four comic books. They'll take you about 20 minutes to read total. You know, 26 and a half minutes of the you know the soundtrack, and then 22 pages of you know this art you know design book kind of thing that come with that are only in the Master Thief Edition. Yeah, they're they're not worth their money if you aren't like super into that. I enjoyed them, but. If I wasn't already into Thief, I don't know that I would have. Anyway, yeah, the, the, you know, according to that, he has, like, a small knife that he, he says, cut, not grab, when it comes to, like, wallets, because they're, like, hanging in a string, and he cuts the string rather than grabbing it, which makes a lot of sense, but, so, presumably he has some small, although, you know, I understand why I'm not necessarily using that if it's very small. Anyway, that's what she said. Yeah, he now uses the blackjack for fighting, and it's the only thing he uses for fighting. And it's just... Yeah, it's it's just another way that this can be... That the fighting in this can be awkward. That the fighting in a thief game can be awkward, you know. Maybe if they make another one, they will eventually find out something that works. But, you know, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's It's like how commandos, you're pretty much screwed if you were discovered at the wrong time, but then that's also, that is one of the main things about that game, make sure you're not discovered at the wrong time. And then in the, the Robin Hood Legend of Sherwood game, it's essentially commandos, except you can actually, you know, fight back at short range, and a bunch of your enemies will only attack at short range, and then some of the, you know, like Little John runs around with the staff, so when you are, like, Yeah, when 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 you attack someone in that game, you can just take them out with the staff and they'll still be alive. So you didn't lose anything by doing so and you can even fight a bunch at the same time. So, you know, that's maybe kind of sort of, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to figure out what to do in this situation. You know, Hitman has also struggled with what about short range when you're, you know, spotted because logically he should be able to fight back in some way, but then, you know, once that becomes an option in, you know, some in the fourth one, Blood Money, and definitely in Absolution, although it's that quick time event thing, because again, how do you do it exactly? Yeah, it's just, then, then it's suddenly almost too powerful, and you can just run around beating people up, and yeah, you know, as long as you're close when it starts and there aren't people far off that are gonna shoot you yeah it's it's difficult to to necessarily deal with but yeah when at the end of a fight you will be prompted to use the you know to, to knock them out to engage in a knockout attack or if too long passes they will come to and they'll be ready to fight but then it'll only take a few hits if you don't want to engage in a full takedown at the end of the fight, you can also just keep hitting them with the blackjack, but depending on their armor and how tough a guard it is, 
it may take a bunch of hits, you know. But on simple, you know, on easy ones, it'll only take one or two, thus making it quicker than, a, you know, regular takedown. Now, your inventory, you know, when, when you scroll through your inventory, the only things that it will show are the special arrows and your, you know, the, the food that you use to heal and the poppies that you use to refill focus energy. There is no... You, you don't... Like, you, you never equip the blackjack the razor, the the wire cutters, or the like. You know, you, you use those when you choose to use them. When the... the missions themselves are a bit hit and miss, arguably, but Honestly, overall, I enjoyed and I remember each of them. The, you know, in, in, in the first three Thief games, it would, you know, often be like breaking and entering to the houses of people in the city. And in this, yeah, not... Not quite, but yeah, I'll get into details about it. The and and the missions certainly are very straightforward. There aren't many like surprises along the way. Now the the first one in includes a jewelry store, and you know even has a safe. The the second one has this meat processing plant where the the bodies of those who died from the gloom are literally on hooks transported to this big furnace where they're all burnt to death burnt to ash rather yeah and that that really it 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 sh it does show that excuse me it is a very callous world still that this takes place in and yeah, just in general, these are very, yeah, very memorable levels. I'm not going to say what every single one of them is, but there are some hidden mazes, a, at least one mansion. There is an insane asylum, and unlike the third, here it actually fits. And, you know, yeah, really very directly ties into the plot rather than it feeling like Silent Hill just, you know, like, like suddenly Garrett took a detour into Silent Hill. And as far as that goes, it is almost as good atmosphere as Silent Hill. Obviously, a survival horror game with enemies that are numerous, varied, and challenging tops a stealth game that doesn't have that many enemies that you have to deal with in that and hardly any of them supernatural any time but it's still very like if you I mean there, there are people who, who specifically like highlighted the fifth one as one that they really love I can understand that and yeah, I mean, if this is just really the kind of thing that you love, and I mean, yeah, I I would love it more if it wasn't just, if there wasn't one very similar in the third game, and if it overall fit more. Like, this very kind of personal ghost story is still, this doesn't quite fit for Thief, but it fits more with the rest of the game here than it does in Thief 3. But, yeah, I mean, if we're just talking stand, like, standout levels, even if they've already been in some of the other games, and we're talking like really creepy, disturbing levels, and ones that, I mean, 
yeah, like if again, I'm not entirely sure if there's like a demo, but it if there was like a demo of just the the first part of that level or something, yeah, that would you know, and and again, yeah, if if like if this is where it stands or falls, if it's like you've heard that you you you're like almost ready to buy it there's like 50 50 and you're just looking for you you want to buy it you just want to hear that one thing that will put it over the top that will make it and you've heard about the the asylum level and you're like is it actually as good as it yes it is awesome it is a fantastic level if that is where stands or falls definitely get the game and yeah just some some very compelling levels and just yeah, it's each of them is distinct from the rest. And something that is very noteworthy is that when you look at the like I already mentioned that you know, you'll you'll be breaking and entering in houses in the city in the first three games. That's not every single level. As I you know, also said that you know, there are parts of Parts of the world of the you know of thief that aren't the city that are these caverns these you know ancient ruins and yeah you know mazes and the like and that that actually yeah they they get that here the, it's just that the levels in this are often what would be the non like yeah the 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 levels in this are what would especially in the, what would in the first game would be the ones that you couldn't necessarily quite stealth through and where you couldn't necessarily avoid being seen by all enemies and you might have to fight or at least run or run or the like and yeah ones that flesh out the world but don't necessarily specifically deal with the plot and in this it fleshes out the world they th these levels flesh out the world and they forward the plot there's not a single level of this that doesn't forward the plot and yeah it 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 really gets a lot of the world right which again to a certain extent better than the third game and yeah some some parts and yeah i i again guys Again, this has always been the thing with Thief. How do you make an entire game based around a character who is apolitical? He, he steals things. That's what he does. He breaks into people's houses. He steals the, the, their valuables and he gets back out. And who does not really get involved with the world around him unless he absolutely has to. How do you make a story about that? How do you make three stories about that? You know, how does it, how do you keep it from just feeling like an expansion pack, just a level pack? You know, just a bunch of levels that aren't really connected. You know, Thief and Hitman have always struggled with this. And the second one made it work by having you in the city most of the time, but having you do a lot of different things, not just stealing. You're always stealthing, but you're not always stealing. You're like eavesdropping. You know, there's a, there's, there's, you're, you're framing someone, you know, various different things. And yeah, in this, they actually, you can usually stealth your way through them, although there are areas that don't have enemies. And that's, you know, in again in the in the trilogy, usually those places sometimes you can't stealth, sometimes, but otherwise you would kind of have to then, you know, fight them. And that's what you don't usually do here. You don't fight very much. You can go through the game without fighting, pretty much. And yeah, it's just and so you can go through these areas. It it just it's unfortunate that it, it's it's similar to the the problems that frictional games, you know, Penumbra and Amnesia One, the the problems they have with enemies because kind of sorta can you fight them? Can't you? Do you just have to run? Because if you have no enemies, 
such as is the case in Penumbra Requiem, you know, the expansion pack, very much an expansion pack. Yeah, it's just it's just not as engaging because there's no constant sense of that threat. There's it's not that at any time a monster could come out and you then have to deal with that, you know. So yeah, they, they took out the monsters and yeah, it it's, does somewhat suffer for it, but if they make another one, if these developers make another one, I would probably get it. I might wait for a sale, but I would probably get it unless it's like horribly reviewed. Like when you look at various reviews and this, it fairly positive, but with a lot of still a lot of negative. Like I think it has like seventy percent on you know various. That's kind of when you when you take you know. Again, there, there are ones that go further than that, but some of those, again, are about the technical issues. And of course, the technical issues, if you really experience bad technical issues, as some have, you know, as some have experienced, you know, the, the audio completely drops or, you know, it, it erases a save game of yours. Yeah, stop playing. Demand your money back. Obviously, I'm not saying, but if you, if you account for those, it tends to be, yeah, it's actually a pretty well-made game. It's just there's some problems with it, and so, and some hate the game. But it's still, when you really look overall, it tends to be that, you know, it could be better. But yeah, yeah, I probably would get a sequel. And honestly, maybe they would improve on that aspect. Maybe they would fit in some more enemies and just have those enemies ones you can sneak past. You know, it would. But but yeah, this. It, it gets the, you know, this is a very full fleshed out world. This is, you know, in spite, again, it, it, it gets rid of the lore from the first three, but it does have something of its own to, to, for you to explore, for you to learn about. And it, it is a fairly full world. It's just not as, as full as, say, Dishonored. Or, again, the, especially the first two Thief games, the third one gets a little inconsistent, a little it weakens some of the factions. But anyway, yeah, it's it's an it's a compelling world. Again, not everybody will find it, but if if you do somewhat get into this, and again, you know, give it until give it the first one or two missions. Yeah, if if you get into it, you will likely find the, the various levels to be interesting each on their own and they're all they're very distinctly connected again there's nothing in this where the story doesn't develop which again there's not story in every single level in any of the three thief games of you know yeah so so yeah it's it forced the story it fleshes out the world and it the the one thing that i would say again some more supernatural would really have been good because that is again that is a huge part of the world of thief the supernatural and the magic and the fact that the magic is not limited to the three factions i mentioned although the, you know the hammerites would say they never use magic there might still be some you know but especially the other two there's there's magic there's the supernatural there are a ton of different groups in the thief world and you know the the third game kind of forgets that but yeah and i wish there were more distinct that there were more groups and that there were was more clear magic and such but overall yeah this gets the world very nicely and it's a fairly short game i'll get into the length but it's also very focused it's just it's, it can be confusing, but there is a lot like, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the plot is forwarded by every level, the, you know, you learn new things, you go to new places every time, you know, or at least you visit more of these places when you go there, yeah. And the... Suppose that 
with the the side missions themselves are divided into two different ones the, the ones you get from Basso your friend and Fence I believe he is which are often just one place and take you know a minute or two and yeah it's it's a lot like just breaking into a house in the city it, you know like it'll you you will know if you've you know yeah, you, you'll know if you've just started a Basso side mission or if you just broke into a random house because Garrett will say what he's looking for or something. And when you found it, it'll say, you know, side mission completed. But other than that, yeah, you know, you could almost mistake a Basso side mission for just breaking into a random house in the city hub. So, yeah. And then there are the client side missions in which you you know, it, it'll take, you know, 30 minutes, maybe a little more, maybe some less, you know, and you, you know, you have to return to the client with the item and you can replay them. Although again, in those, the, the play styles don't seem to matter all that much, but yeah. And yeah, the, the basic idea of side missions in this is you know, go into a specific location, steal one, at least one specific item, and yeah, these buildings will often be empty. Although the client side missions, there there might be some guards, and one of these includes this house designed by master engineer, which is just, you know, yeah, one big puzzle, and it's it's a lot of fun. This no longer the you know where the others had big open levels, yeah, this does not. And I'm not sure there's really one specific standout level other than the asylum, which again was already in the third one. It uh, yeah, they but again, they are all pretty good and you know yeah this doesn't have the varied stealth objectives of thief 2 it yeah you're often just you're you're asked by a person to go and steal a specific thing and told where it you know which building it'll be inside or something like that and then you go and do that that's pretty much it so again and yeah it's it's difficult it you know part of what work what made that work in thief 2 the the very stealth objectives is that you are very involved in the plot and again it doesn't start immediately but once you're involved you are involved in the plot and yeah i mean in this you learn about the plot gradually, and the plot certainly develops with every. But you know, Garrett is going around. He's he's remembering Aaron and wondering, you know, what really happened that that night. And he, you know, other than that, he's just he's going on these missions. He's asked by someone. You know, this is his livelihood. He's asked by someone to, you know, go and steal this specific thing. So he does that and then he's repaid and that's more or less it and you know the, the plot happens within the levels as he steals which yeah it it's not the first thing that has happened in a thief game and again it's hard to do it any other way than that because you're a thief and there should still be some story so yeah it's just and yeah still it it does work and the you know the map is has even less detail than before where you know in the first you know it, it might it will say like you know kitchen bedroom and then you may have to be able to figure out wait where exactly am I on this map 
you know, it is especially the case in the first one, and some of the maps in the first one are completely outdated and written by people who didn't communicate the way we do, you know, so it's like, I have to decipher this thing, I have to figure out how do I get from where I am to there, and all this, you know, it might not mark north, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, usually it would be, okay, I can tell there's a kitchen at this spot in the map. I'm looking around the room, pots, pans, oven, this is the kitchen. Okay, so if I go, you know, bring out my compass, okay, so this would be west, and on the map, west is where I need to go. Okay, in this, it does show, you know, it, it shows Garrett, it shows which direction he's facing, and it, you know, it has the compass, which is also on the mini-map. Then it shows, you know, walls, stairs, you know, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. There's, you know, you, you can't even see, if there are several floors, you can only see the current one, even if you, you know, even once you've been on the other ones, where, again, in the other games, you could always look at the, you know, you could see the other floors if you had the map for those floors you know, whether you were on that floor or not, and thus plan, well, I need to get to there, so if I go through here, through the maps, and yeah. And, yeah, it really makes finding your way a lot more, yeah, more, more annoying than it should be. Now, the... You, yeah, and, and the, thus you no longer use context clues to figure out which room you're in. You know, you can see which room you're in on the map, but you can't read what the, the various rooms are supposed to be. And you can't, you know, in, in the second one, you can see where you've been. It will be marked on the map. You know, the, the basic area, not too specifically, but that basic room. And... You know, also in the hub, you'll also only be able to see the current hub you're in. And some of those also, you know, if you're on the roofs, you can only see the roofs. And, yeah. And the... Yeah, there's a lot of dummy scenery. Some have likened this to a corridor first-person shooter that marks the path. Yeah, it definitely has that feel a lot of the way, and this is saying, you know, it's more like an arcade than, you know, the way you move from level to level. And, you know, and if you go to higher ground, you'll be harder to see. The, the city hub. It's irritating and difficult to navigate. It is so oddly... Again, when you look at the City Hub map, you cannot see where an exit or an entrance is. You cannot see if where you're going is, like, leading to... Like I said, you, can't, you can only see that specific area of the City Hub. If you forget, like, it'll, it'll say, you know, like, South, South Quarter, Stone Market. But if you forget if you should be going, you know, North, South, West, East, if you're not sure where you want to be, like, objectives, it'll highlight objectives, and it'll, you know, point to, to the basic, that's fine, that it, it does do that, but it does not highlight anything else. It does not, like, if, if it's not on the current, you know, it, on, the, on the current city hub, in the current section of the city hub, you can't even see where the nearest, like, shop is, where your fence is. And, you know, I mean, the moment you're on a, a city hub section that has those, they will be highlighted, but you can't tell it please, you know, mark it so that I can get a counter that 
like with the objectives and you to be fair when you have like side missions and you're not yet on a mission you can't do side side missions are always in the city hub if you have several different side missions and you you know you have the thing to you know say you have to go there to start the next mission you can choose to track any of them and it'll highlight it on the map and point in the right direction so there's that but yeah you can't tell it you know so so if you're in an area and you suddenly just I don't remember I don't remember where my fence is what section of the city that is and I don't even remember how where that section is you know east west north or south of this area the game is not going to help you. You do, you can get maps online, and you probably should. The, you know, again, not to. I'm trying not to praise Steam too much. It, I, I, I realize now that, like everything else, there are there are positives and negatives. Still, Steam has some that are free. You don't even have to own the game to get them. That's all. So, you know, you, I'm not certain if you even have to be a Steam user, but yeah, you know, becoming a Steam user doesn't cost anything, and if you don't want to use the user account, that's it, you don't have to, but yeah, you know, and, and there probably are other ones, just Steam is where I usually find stuff like that, but, but yeah, you know, they, they might mark, you know, where you start this side mission, where you start that mission, you know, the moment when you replay a side mission or a main mission, you go to where you started it. If you don't remember where you started it, yeah, the game's not going to tell you. You know, if you if you go to that place and you press the use key, even if you didn't know, then it will ask, "Do you want to replay that?" You know, and then you can say no if that wasn't what you meant. But that's that's really the only way. And like with Thief 3, which also has a city hub. Just much of Thief's world is not even the city. And that, again, that is something that this game gets because every mission takes you beyond the city hub in one way or another. The the mission is never city hub. You know, it's, it's always some other, yeah. And the yeah the the I've I've already mentioned you know caverns they're they're you know cemetery and such and yeah in in this the actual missions take you to to out to to various of those and the. Yeah, I maintain that that Garrett does not walk the streets. In in this, you can at least sometimes go, you know, unseen on the roofs and such. But it's still just yeah. But yeah, you can walk the street in this, and no one but the city watch will particularly, you know, take notice of you. Which makes a certain amount of sense since you're not wearing a steel mask. But the you know, yeah, the, the City Watch and their number might increase or their toughness might increase over the course of the, the, you know, as you complete more missions. And some areas might be controlled by gangs instead of City Watch. And yeah, there is no fast travel and there are relatively few stores. So you do have to, you know, again, you can't just anywhere you are just get more of, you know, what you need. Although, Rarely, you might find a store outside of the, the city hub, but yeah, and it, it makes as little sense as it ever does in, in those kind of, you know, it, the, the jokes in, the, the running gag about that in the first press start movie is, is quite, yeah, really, really hits the nail on the head with, with how strange that is, but yeah. In time, you do get used to how the city hub, you know, it doesn't really change. It's just more of the city becomes available to you as you get further in the game. But the various areas don't really change. It's not like, you know, suddenly you can't go that way. Not particularly, at least. 
but it is still, you shouldn't have to fight this much just to be able to navigate the city hub, which you are forced to, no matter how little you want to complete side missions, even if you want to only focus on the missions, even if you barely buy anything, the game will force you to go through the city hub. There is no avoiding that completely in this. And when you load a city hub area again, guards respawn, which is annoying if you accidentally went to the wrong area and you find, well, I had to go back that way actually to get to the area that I want to go to. And a, you know, a window that you open could be where a side mission starts or replays. It could be you know, the way to get to another area of the hub. Yeah, you, you just don't know. There, you know, I would make it a practice to not open a window without having manually saved, you know, not too long before it. There is at least one side mission that literally starts back up when you go through the window. And you might have thought that you were just going to another area of the city. And yeah, you have to complete that entire side mission before you can do, you know, I'll turn around trying to open the window, can't, because I have to complete the side mission first. It's not a long side mission, but I didn't want to complete the side mission. I wanted to get to another area of the city hub. And yeah, the, you know, the, the polish of, yeah, the, yeah, this, this needed more polish, but to be fair, all three, you know, the, the, Thief Trilogy also needed more polish. This, you know, no, none of these four games have open world, nor do any of the three Deus Ex games. They are too plot heavy, too atmospheric for that kind of thing, you know, compared to Assassin's Creed and Grand Theft Auto, where the time of day can change. You can move a lot without encountering an enemy because Assassin's Creed, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily looking for you, so if you don't cause trouble, the police aren't going to bother you. Same for Grand Theft Auto. And, yeah, you know, with, in, in Thief 1 and 2, you had nice open levels, because you could then ghost through them, because, you know, it's, it also allows for there to be a lot of guards, and, yeah, and just a lot to explore and you know Arkham has very open areas as well you know that is a hub as well you know which is yeah, and the three Deus Ex games as well hubs and you know city hubs and yeah it again it, it works because you can fight or you know outrun pretty much any enemy in, in an area that you've already been through in Ark, in again, first two Arkham games at least, much like in Assassin's Creed, but you know, it does actually also have consequences and challenge. Commandos has open levels, you know, again, because it is, it can sustain it, then, you know, you get to explore, you get to try different ways of completing. Yeah, the, the Thief 3 hub is pointless, because unlike Deus Ex, they are, there aren't varied cities, there's only the one city. And in Deus Ex, you can do a number of things. You can talk to people on the street. You can, you know, in these two Thief games, you can move around. You can break into people's houses. You can, you know, fight or avoid guards. And you can, you know, buy supplies. That's it. In Deus Ex, you can also actually talk to people, you know, there are side missions that have nothing to do with stealing, and when you find somewhere, you know, if you find a container that might have something that you want, maybe you can blow it up, maybe you can, you know, use multi-tools to disable the, the lock, maybe you pick the lock, maybe you, you know, just break it with a hard object that you smash against it, you know. Again, in Thief, at most, well, you, I guess, you know, you, you look for a switch or you unlock it. That's it. That's what these have, you know. And, yeah, again, a lot of Thief's world is not the city, you know, and it really makes the, the Thief's world seem small, if it, if it is, you know. And, yeah, again, that's 
part of the problem with Thief 3 and Thief 3's, Thief 3's City Hub. And here, a lot of it is fixed because the, you know, breaking and entering is made fun again, which is really not, not that much in Thief 3 and also unfocused in Thief 3. And yeah, the levels in this are all, all take you beyond the City Hub where, yeah, some of the ones in 3, it's just, well, this is, this is the, the cathedral of the Hammerites. You can, you can go right up to the, the entrance of it in the City Hub. And then, you know, when you want to start the mission, you just, you know, go in. You, th this is where the, the, you know, so it's right there in the city. And it's, you know, and they also place the, the pagans right there in the city. And some, I've done an entire video on Thief 3. That is not the, 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 the point here. Yeah, the, basically, this does better at a city hub than Thief 3. And I maintain straight up, like, yeah, it, yeah, overall, I prefer there not to be a city hub. I think it would be fine if the side missions were just something like, before you start a mission, it's like, these, you know, do you want to complete these side missions? And then the store still just be between, between the missions, but unlike Thief 1 and 2, if they want to do it this way, sure, let you save up money and let you keep arrows and such between levels and, you know, let you resell them and such. Where the... I suppose... Yeah, even on the easiest difficulty setting, this will challenge players and it is very much, as others have pointed out, stick to the shadows or die quickly. You can, at the start at least, only carry five food. And it will not heal you all the way with, with one. So just keep that in mind in case you want to go through a mission fighting. You can carry five at the start. None of those are going to heal you. All the way immediately, you know, by by just by itself. If if you're at the lowest, and you're not necessarily going to find very much in the mission, so yeah, that's that's that gives you an idea of the yeah. You will heal if you go into the clock tower, and that is also purely between missions. It's it's in the city hub. You can buy trinkets, there are 13 total, and each grants a boon, such as less damage taken from traps, more, you know, more health when you heal, more health total, things like that. When you die, you have to redo. You don't get to just respawn without having lost anything like Assassin's Creed. The, the, the difficulty options, there are... 13 and you know you can start the game by choosing them in in which case you will then have to play the rest of the game will with them that is worth noting you don't get to, to the, the game itself tells you that you know note that once you've chosen a, a difficulty you will not be able to change it although I didn't try the custom ones but I think it's the same I, I only did the, the main three ones but but yeah and in case you don't choose them, if, if you just read about them and say, oh, that sounds a little too tough, you can impose it on yourself if you later on feel like it's too easy. You know, not all of them, but, but some of them. Like, again, you know, not using focus, not using, like, you know, particularly deadly arrows and such. You can choose to do that. That's entirely up to you. And there, there's an achievement for completing the entire game without having used focus or, or something like or maybe it's not using focus after like the first mission I don't remember 100% but it's something like that not using focus for almost all of it and yeah so and the the you know this increases replayability you can work your way up to the toughest of the difficulty settings and such 
the graphics are very detailed and you know things look absolutely amazing and you know photorealistic fog smoke fire rain mud lightning just yeah now the the color scheme is a bit I, I think I read that it's like I'm I'm not good at judging it myself, but I read that it's like desaturated blacks and browns, and yeah, that that does, you know, you you wish you could see it more, and that's again, the Thief World in the first three is very, not no, not like bright, it's it's very dark and and disturbing, but there are like some of the magic abilities are like very bright and and clear. The sometimes the enemy will, you know, there there are AI bugs. There there are, and one I encountered is that if I throw my throwable, the the guard will react. However, if I fire dummy arrows into vases near him, he doesn't react at all. So, yeah. And if they, you know, if they see a door open or close, or a light go off or come on, you know, come on, they will investigate that. And it's already been pointed out that you're really only dealing with two human enemies: the the ones carrying a sword and the ones carrying a crossbow. And yeah, that is. That is also the case in the, you know, I mean, Thief 3 adds magic user to that. Well, actually, yeah, there, there are some magic users, but Thief 3 makes them more common, you might say. But, yeah, there aren't that many different human enemies in the Thief series, and that's because most of the enemies are supernatural. Most of the enemy types, you know, you encounter plenty of human enemies, but they're only those couple of types. When you encounter enemies that are really fun to fight, that you don't necessarily sneak past, they're supernatural or animal. They're not, yeah, you know, I, I you know, in the process of, you know, taking notes for this, I tried to, there's, there's like a dozen and a half in like the first two. And yeah, the, it remains that there are only, the, when you talked about the human ones, there are only those two or three types. And part of it is that in those three, you're better at fighting than in this. Now, if you are at higher ground than enemies and they don't personally have crossbow, they will start chucking rocks at you. But it is pretty easy, especially in the city hub, to get just high enough up and just far enough away that they can't see you anymore and they forget about you and that you know that that's when we get into Assassin's Creed territory with like you know oh can't find him well never mind and the, you know that's also part of what I really you know if Garrett ever gets you know Garrett doesn't get noticed and if he did he would very quickly deal with that and you know not cause a big like if he runs away from a guard in the city Surely they're just going to post more guards and have, you know, he's already, like, it's it's described at some point, he's like the most wanted man in the city or something, you know, because of the whole ritual thing, which we don't know exactly what happened that night, but whatever happened, the guards certainly want, you know, the, you know and the thief taker general has made it his mission in life to get you, you know, so, yeah, the moment that they see you, and again, you're not that, difficult to to recognize once they know you know it's it's a thief running around wearing black leather and so you know the moment that they've at least seen okay there's a thief somewhere up there shouldn't they like you know surround the area and attack it's just yeah city hub overall just does not work for the thief world now i already mentioned the detection meter you know everything that has meter in this has a very distinct very easy to read you know, easy to recognize, you know, meter or, you know, visual aid in, in one way or another. And, yeah, the, the detection meter for this goes from being see-through, you know, at first it's invisible, literally, and then when they start to see you, it'll be see-through and it'll start to, you know, f start to fill up with white. If they're just getting, like, an idea, 
there is something there, isn't there? And then, you know, and depending on how much they can see, it'll fill up faster. You know, then it'll get yellow when they're like, really, okay, there's something around here that I need to deal with. If they know where you are and they know that you're a threat, it's red and they're going to keep pursuing you. Now, the there are caged birds and dogs, which is a nice and easy way to get out of having to animate either. And the while the birds will only hear, you know, they, they will react to loud movement near the cage, the dogs also, but the dogs will also be able to smell you. And yeah, he's, he's a busy thief and it's leather. He doesn't have that much time for personal hygiene. They will bark and, you know, the, the, the birds, well, some of the birds will, the, yeah, they'll, they'll bark and attract a lot of attention. And, yeah, basically avoid them like the gloom or gas them. You can always gas those inside cages, but again, that might get noticed, you know. And as far as I've been able to tell, when you gas someone inside a cage, again, keep in mind, they're not dead. They're just, they're, you know, at least it doesn't kill humans. I'm not sure if I would necessarily kill, like, it just... Okay, maybe they are dead. I'm a murderer. So anyway, that means that they no longer notice you. And uh, yeah, the the you know those are basically the two ways you can deal with. If you're anywhere near a dog, it's gonna notice you. But again, it starts out white. And if you stay away far enough, or if you back away, the moment you see the the detection thing. You know, ooh, I was a little too close, I can back away. You can swoop away, maybe. You know, always be mindful of your surroundings, young one, and have good situational awareness so that you don't swoop back and, you know, knock into a guard or something. They don't take kindly to that. They, that they will notice. And, yeah, the, the guards will literally always keep to their guard post or their patrol guards again, or, you know, examine if something distracted them. They'll go in the direction of that noise or the, the like. And I didn't use it much, but I believe you can start fires to distract them, and they have to deal with that, you know, if you set fire to an oil patch. So, yeah. The challenge mode in this, not counting the DLC, which I'll get to, there are two levels, the, the Baron's Mansion and a Prostitution and Opium Den. And the, these two Challenge Mode maps are chunks of these two levels, and you can play them entirely independently of the main game. I believe they're even, that the two of them are even you know, right there when you first open the game without you having to do anything. And yeah, nothing you do in there is going to affect your you know, story, game, and vice versa. Which also means you can't bring in, you know, upgrades or the like. And this is actually where it gets the most like Classic Thief. Because these are quite open levels with a lot of different paths. You, you can do, you can go in whatever direction you want. Spend however much time, you know, searching, you know, well, I'll get to that. You know, there's there's a ton of loot, and you're, you know, in this you actually start out with the ability to see footsteps, which would still be nice if you could just hear them. The thing is, you can't predator your way through them. You know, it's... If you fight, or knock out, or kill, it will cost you points. You start with no arrows, so, you know, at most you can fight back with the blackjack, and it's all timed, so yeah, for, for that it doesn't really fit. Yeah, you know, so it's still not quite classic thief. Now, you get points for taking, you know, taking risk, like pickpocketing someone or moving out of the shadow immediately after someone can't see you anymore, so things like that. And the 
yeah, the, the, there are three modes, chain and gain, which, you know, there's a 60 second counter, which basically every 60 seconds you have to steal another piece of loot. If, that, if the 60 seconds run out, the bonus counter, if every time you steal one of those, it'll add one to the bonus counter. If the 60 seconds run out, you have to restart, you know, it, it brings the counter back to zero, and then you have, I think, about 57, 47 seconds, Star Trek, to, to steal one more thing, and then, you know, if you don't get it in those 47 seconds, then the it will just end, which is also what's going to happen if you die or if you reach the exit. And the then there's you know chain and game limited, which puts a 10 minute time limit on the whole level. And you know you get extra bonus for like the the less you use focus if you search every picture frame if you got all the loops and things like that. And then the third mode is special loot hunt, which has this hot and cold you know indicator and yeah, you're going there for special loot, and every time you get special loot, one piece, it'll unlock the next one, and it'll, yeah. And there's no real randomization here, so, you know, once you've done fairly well, you might not necessarily play it in. I, this is, it's it's like the, like, the kind of racing games, where you just keep playing the same thing just to max out your time, and that kind of thing, and that's fine. I have nothing, you know, I'm not personally particularly into racing games, but hey, more power to you if that's your thing. The thing is, I don't, that's not really that appealing to, you know, big thief fans. And again, I mean, if you go into this game, if you play the rest of the game like a racing game, it is going to, it just, it is not going to work at all. That it, it really stands in stark contrast to the rest of the game. And yeah, it's, it's, I don't think it's a very good choice, and I mean, you know, compare it to the challenge mode of Arkham, you know, where, you know, for example, you have entire levels that you then predator your way through. Yeah, I mean, they could have that here as well and just have it, you know, with you trying your best to avoid ever being, you know, no, I mean, you can't really avoid being found when you're predatoring in Batman because it'll leave the people around. But in this, you know, maybe you could hide the the bodies and you could see how many you would maybe maybe make it run infinitely. And every so often, so and so many guards will respond. Maybe make it more guards the longer time passes. And it'll be more and more difficult to get them. And it'll of course take time for you to get them. So Make sure to very quickly take out this and this many guards, hide them, you know, maybe make a, a room that you can always hide them in that never gets checked, something like that, or, you know. And, yeah, you could keep playing and see how long you can keep taking them out and how long you can keep avoiding being found, you know, something like that. And then, of course, the Arkham games also have the, the levels where you fight, and the fighting kind of sucks in this, but you could still, you could have you know, levels where you just parkour your way through. I would love that. You know, where you just run through parkour, maybe, you know, there you could have a the, the racing thing, racing game thing of, you know, try to, I don't know if that is audible. I may need lunch soon. Yeah, the, the you know, make, you know, top your best time and such. And there it's a lot of fun because it's, yeah, you know, it's it parkour. Parkour I can get more into than racing. It's, yeah, but you know, and and the you know, Mirror's Edge have like time attack or time trial. You know, a TMNT has these challenge levels or something like that. And Prince of Persia, the Forgotten Sands for the Wii also has levels like this. And yeah, they're a ton of fun. I don't know why they didn't put that in here. In general, there's just like with a lot of the other cool ideas in this, there's too little of the parkour, especially for each section. You know, there's no, like, no, no, there's really, there's no section where it's just, okay, now, minute straight parkour. You know, it's it's still not like, you know, 
mirror's edge with the awkward start and stop, but it's just, it's still just not long enough. And the, the DLC, the, you know, the challenge mode, you can download the Asylum map. And yeah, you know, if you really love at least the idea, if you haven't gotten any of this yet, and you know, if you haven't bought Thief 2014 yet, and you're considering also getting the, you know, yeah, the, the DLC challenge mode map. Yeah, you know, if if the the asylum seems really appealing to you, yeah, I mean it's the this same creepy, disturbing level and I mean, a chunk of that level, and there is something in there which is different. Let's let's say that guards in that are not necessarily the same guards as in the rest of, you know, as as you mostly encounter. Let's let's go with that. And if you've already played the game, and if you distinctly remember the asylum level, you may already know what I'm talking about, so yeah. And the... Yeah, then there's the, the bank DLC. You know, it's... It wears it on... It wears it on its face. It's, it's literally the description. It's a tribute to the amazing level of Thief 2. And yeah, it has cameras. It's the one level of this that has cameras. And... Yeah, it, it has the base, the same basic elements as the the other client missions. You know, you know, you're going in, you're stealing at least one specific item, and then you leave, and it'll take you at least half an hour, and, and you can replay it however many times. Just realized I'm one of these side missions. There's involves this fortune telling skull. I think they might have been trying to hint at the eye, but it's just the, the eye is so much cooler than, than that. Anyway, yeah, if, if you if you do download the, the bank DLC, there will be seven client missions. Otherwise, it's just the six. Yeah. Basically, if you... With a one-hour methodical playthrough of it, you will get all the loot, all the extras, the vault combination never changes. The location where you find the vault combination, even if you want to go through those steps and say, well, I should, I'm not even sure you need to go through those steps the first time. If you, if you just go straight for the vault and just enter the, the combination, I think it'll just let you in. But yeah, they, they don't randomize this at all. And it's just, yeah, I'm, it might have been difficult to randomize the, the log. I don't know enough about this engine, but you know, you really want to try to do something like that because, yeah, and I, I appreciate that, you know, in in the, you know, I don't actually, I'm not, I yeah, I believe there are leaderboards for the bank DLC as well. You know, randomization might make leaderboards unfair, but, well, depending on how you, I mean, Left 4 Dead also has, but, yeah, it's just, without randomization of any sort it's just it's the same you know so yeah and yeah after you play that one hour methodical playthrough there's not that much reason to go back it's going to be the same thing and you know the the booster packs definitely do not get them unless they're on sale they're mostly not that useful but you know it's yeah, I mean, each has some usefulness, and if you look at the description and you're like, that sounds amazing, I definitely want that. Yeah, sure, I mean, it, it has what it says it has, but yeah, you know, otherwise, I mean, to sum up, the DLC, I don't really recommend it. I'd, I'd recommend getting Thief 2 and playing the whole thing more than getting the bank DLC, the, the actual, I mean, the, the cost is not that much off, and you're getting far more content. I mean, Thief 2, I believe the first time took me 40 hours to get through. Again, that's 40 times as much as the bank 
in, in this one. And even the bank, I'm almost certain I spent more than one hour on the bank in Thief 2. And it's also, I mean, it's by far a larger, more open level. But even just, even without that, just it's more compelling the the way you gradually work your way up to getting into the vault and what you do inside the vault and the whole level everything about it is just so much more compelling there and that's why I, I really wish they hadn't redone the asylum even though it's overall you know better but you know then Thief 3 again overall is a better game than this and Thief 3's asylum overall in some ways are better than the asylum here and yeah the the bank like in two I, I really wish that they had steered clear of that entirely that they had said we're gonna we're gonna get the 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 core right which a lot of the way they do but we're not gonna do any overt like we're not gonna do just like instead of a bank instead of an asylum just come up with something else that has some similar like Silent Hill 1 has you go to a hospital and Silent Hill the the bad one the bad port one that was like original like PSP or the the one with the trucker Travis the trucker I think yeah that one has you go into an asylum so the, yeah you have some difference there you know yeah make it like well make it make it something else you know and again bank maybe maybe a an especially rich person's mansion which has a lot of locks and, and something like that and that you have to very carefully maneuver around you know maybe still not but yeah just something else now the I I mentioned the boss battles. I'm not entirely sure I got too much into them, but just briefly, the yeah, the they there there's insta kill. You can sneak rather than you know go head on, and you still you're still not forced out of ghosting. The game never truly forces you. There there are times where you have to run, but it's not at the expense of like ghosting. It's not you know, yeah, and and certainly the game never forces you to fight. And mostly when you do parkour nobody else realizes that you are doing that but but yeah they're they're okay they're not that great but yeah it's it's especially the fact that there's this insta kill where again when you fight enemies i mean yeah some of them are extremely tough but it just it seems like even these boss battles shouldn't just have this kind of insta kill and yeah the the ending does not really provide closure and the you know it it feels like it feels like uh, we're we're seeing we're getting about a third of the full game because there is so little of everything there every idea they they put in here you know and most of them really work there's just too little too too few places to use them and it feels like yeah that a lot was cut out which again i'm not sure was at all the case it's just they probably just couldn't didn't have time to do them because it was rushed out didn't have time to put as many places you could use these things or maybe they the they had too many good ideas and they should kill their darlings but yeah ultimately it ends up feeling like we're only getting about a third of the final product there are cutscenes where you don't quite know how you got from where you were before the cutscene to 
you know where you are during it and and some of the opposite as well a cutscene will end and then suddenly you're in a situation that you can't quite recognize from there, there's at least one time where I was certain that I was going to be attacked at the end of the cutscene and then instead the the person who I thought was going to attack was gone and it's just yeah is very very much so and the yeah I suppose that pretty much I yeah in in closing I have you know I'm gonna follow this up with giving you my times for completion I have completed every single side mission at least once I completed the you know the bank DLC a few times to make sure I found everything so I could properly review it and you know and, and tried to find everything in general in the game I've completed every mission once and tried to mix up which you know play style I got and sometimes it'll also you'll get a completely different play style you go into a level figuring you know I'll run into so and so many enemies and if I just sneak past them all and then suddenly you'll leave and it's predator that's literally that happened to me it's just one of the last several levels I yeah anyway yeah there's you know so so that's the basic idea and I spent some time playing the challenge modes to you know try out all the different things that could happen in those and yeah now the I, I spent three hours on the bank DLC making sure I got everything I spent four hours on the side missions that's you know not counting the bank one every client side mission and all of Basso's I spent nine hours in the city hub so so yeah and eleven and a half hours on the plot so yeah that gives you a pretty good indication of just how much time and and the city hub I didn't run around just you know I, I didn't really if if I explored it was usually on the way to something my nine hours in the city hub that's the time I spent getting back and forth as far as side missions go getting to the next place the mission starts maybe getting back to the clock tower and picking up some stash supplies going to a store to get some more stuff you know or sell something if I was near max capacity yeah nine hours and I already described how annoying it is to have to be in the side city hub so so yeah and that yeah that that gives you an idea of the yeah and I I intend to replay the 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 non DLC side missions and try to make sure to get everything and get all like special objectives there there's every client side mission and every mission has optional objectives that you can try for and you know you'll probably have to go for a specific playstyle you know there might be one that's you know do not be detected well maybe you won't be able to fight anyone then and you know stuff like that you know kill so and so many people then you're not ghosting and yeah I intend to play the the, the side missions until I'm I have pretty much everything I you know yeah I'm, I'm trying to cut down on obsessing over whether I have absolutely everything in games you know and then I'm gonna play every single mission until I played it on all three playstyles and have basically all of the again loot and special you know and special objectives and such I may add an annotation once I've done all that, you know, saying how what what my times look like then for you know side mission city hub and main missions. Yeah, and and honestly, once I've done that, 
I probably won't keep playing that, playing this, where, again, I, I had a ton of fun in Blacklist, replaying every side mission, every, you know, I'm playing in co, playing co-op some of the, the side missions, and every single mission on all three, and really making sure I got all three playstyles and such, and, you know, in, in this, I'll, I'll try, but I don't, like, like I said, I don't think that, you know, it's just, it's not going to be as varied gameplay as it is in Blacklist. And ultimately, it's still going to amount to a lot of sneaking from place to place, picking up things that aren't worth that much individually, and mostly avoiding being seen. And, yeah. And that's the note I'll leave it on. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.